Good morning, Your Honor. Are we on, Madam Monitor? Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we begin early today because uh, the court received yesterday witnesses motion to quash subpoena or in the alternative to issue a protective order that motion was filed by uh, patrick jennings esquire of the ment law group 225 asylum street 15th floor in hartford connecticut is attorney jennings in the courtroom yes sir you can approach uh if you would please council table or you can just approach the podium. Sure. Is the podium mic? Uh... Thank you. Uh, I believe that should pick me up from here. Attorney Jennings, you may be heard on the motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I filed a motion with the court yesterday on behalf. Yes, Madam Clerk. Uh, Patrick Jennings from the Mental Law Group on behalf of Attorney Mike Rose. And Your Honor, thank you for uh, setting this setting this in and, and hearing this motion. Um, the motion was filed on behalf of Attorney Mike Rose, who represented uh, Fotis Dulos in a divorce proceeding. Um, defense counsel has subpoenaed Attorney Rose to testify in this matter, um, and it is our position that the content of his communications and interactions with Mr. Dulos with Mr. Dulos or uh, squarely fall within the protections of the attorney-client privilege. Um, that privilege, as the court is well aware, has long been recognized um, in the state of Connecticut and across the country. It is of paramount importance to the legal profession. Um, and case law is also clear that that privilege survives the death of a client. Um, there are very limited exceptions to that privilege. Uh, one such exception is the crime fraud exception. Um, and in those instances where the facts fit into fit squarely within an exception to the broad privilege, a court may rule that it does not apply and compel the testimony of an attorney. Um, in order for that to happen, the court must find that probable cause exists that the content of the privileged communication um, or the content of the communication between the attorney and the deceased client involved the planning or commission of a crime. Essentially that the client used the services of an attorney and the attorney served as a conspirator in the committing of a crime, either knowing or unknowing, but used their professional services to aid and assist the former client in the commission of a crime. It's our position that those facts do not exist here. Uh, the representation at issue concerning a divorce proceeding um, fits squarely within uh, the bounds of that privilege. And as such, um, Attorney Rose cannot and should not be compelled to testify. Furthermore, that divorce proceeding was sealed by the divorce court in that matter, which poses a further limitation to Attorney Rose being able to apply with being able to comply with a court subpoena um, and provide testimony in this matter. So for those reasons, we're asking that uh, this honorable court quash the subpoena. Attorney Schoenhorn, you may be heard. Thank you. And uh, I thank Attorney Jennings for uh, his presentation. Um, I did speak uh, two days ago with Attorney Ment uh, regarding this matter. And with his permission, I also spoke with Attorney Rose. Um, I don't agree. I don't disagree with much of what Mr. Jennings just said. Um, he is uh, a little bit incorrect uh, when he states that uh, the privilege applies not just to communications, but to any interactions. That's simply not the case. I note that under the Code of Evidence 5-1, uh, specifically, the, and under Connecticut case law, the only communications that are covered by the privilege are those that protect some information regarding 
informed legal advice, quote unquote. And that's, of course, from the seminal case of Tom Ullman versus State. I know Your Honor uh, was familiar with attorney, the late attorney Ullman. Uh, I don't know if Your Honor was aware of the circumstances, but the court had ordered that he testify against his client concerning communications of when the case was on. I can't remember if it was a failure to appear case, but where certain uh, information that was conveyed that was ordered disclosed because it did not fall within the meaning of the, uh, the attorney-client privilege. It specifically under that case and some of the other cases cited has to be in, inextric inextricably linked to giving of legal advice. Um, so for example, giving a client telephone numbers, et cetera, et cetera, is not covered by the privilege um, as well as it's, if it's not the, if it doesn't go into the uh, substance of the representation, it is not covered under cases such as State versus Davis. Um, the code is of course, talks about um, back and forth. So it covers, it's reciprocal communications between the defendant and his lawyer and vice versa. And um, the purpose is to encourage frank disclosure by client to lawyer without the fear of subsequent disclosure. And I can I agree that the fact that the uh, individual, in this case, Mr. Dulos is deceased, does not in any way waive the privilege any more than a psychiatric privilege is waived by the death of the patient in that case. Um, so I'm not sure what the uh, extent is of the concern regarding the testimony. Um, Mr. Rose, Attorney Rose is not testifying today. He's not scheduled to testify today. Um, and he's going to only be testifying the events time-wise surrounding the production and the review of certain documents, particularly the Dr. Herman report by Mr. Uh, Dulos and Mr. Rose, without getting into their communications, Your Honor, recall that Attorney Meehan was called by the state, and he was allowed to testify to certain reactions, certain um, um, comments made in his presence uh, with Mr. Rose present. So I'm just going to indicate that to the extent that that matter is going to be covered, it's no further. It's the same limitations as was presented with Attorney me and, and his testimony. I also want to correct one um, statement. I'm not sure that Attorney Jennings was aware. The family court matter, the only thing that was sealed was the two court appearances on May 14th and May 17th, 2019, and the transcript and the uh, discussion of what happened there, as well as the sealing of the uh, report, Dr. Herman's report. Everything else remains, well, unless it's been destroyed by now, but remain in the public record. I was able to get a complete copy of documents from the court clerk's office of every pleading going back. Other transcripts were available, uh, had been prepared um, and, and disseminated. So I'm aware of the court's uh, restrictions. I had no intention of going to that. I have no intention of going into any of the... Of the um, uh, substance of communications between attorney Rose and Mr. Dulos. And of course, that would not cover communications that Mr. Rose had with my client, which I intend to uh, elicit to a small degree. There were communications with my client directly by attorney Rose. So I think that based on that, that should eliminate any concern raised by Mr. Jennings. And I will note uh, when I presented what I intended to get into with Mr. Ment, he also agreed with me that he did not see that that would fall within the uh, purview, but to be safe, he wanted to make sure that the court understood that the privilege was still in effect. And I fully, not only do I accept that, I fully agree with that as an important concept. Thank you. The court is not inclined to grant the motion to quash what the court will require though, Attorney Jennings, you may approach the podium. Uh, the motion uh, requests that this court issue an order quashing the defendant's subpoena or otherwise limiting the scope of any compelled testimony through an appropriately tailored protective order. 
the court would require a protective order drafted by your office to be considered. Uh, it is not the court's role to draft its own protective order on behalf of any party. So if that can be filed today, uh, the court will take that up uh, probably tomorrow. The court does not know when uh, Attorney Rose is scheduled to testify, but the court will consider taking up a protective order which the court may grant, deny, or modify. And that should be uh, filed by the close of business today. Yes, Your Honor, and I will, um, I will speak with uh, defense counsel. I know my partner, Mr. Ment, already has um, and try to tailor any protective order to the content that counsel seeks to elicit from Mr. Rose. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are still 10 minutes ahead of schedule, so we'll take our 10-minute uh, break until 10 o'clock, and then we'll start the proceeding. Thank you. All right. This
ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Bring the jury in, please. Uh, would counsel stipulate, please? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue with the state case. Yes, Your Honor. The state would call Gloria Farber to the stand, please. Mrs. Farber, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the clerk. Hello, Thank raise you. your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, to help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, if you so help me God. Thank you. Um, if you could state your name and then spell it for the record. Gloria Farber. And spell it. Pardon? You could spell your name. G L O R I A. As Frank Frank, A R B E R. Thank you. Ms. Farber, you may be seated. Good morning, Mrs. Farber. How are Good you? Good morning. Fine, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Farber, uh, may I call you Gloria? Yes, yes please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gloria, how are you related to Jennifer Farber? Do she was my daughter. Okay. How old are you, Gloria, if you don't mind my asking? 88. Okay. And uh, where do you live? I live in New York City. When was uh, your daughter's Jennifer Farber? Yes. Okay, when was Jennifer born? She was born September 27th, 1968. How many children did Jennifer have? Five. And what are their names? Uh, Petros, Theodore, Christian, Constantine, and Noah. How old was Jennifer in May of 2019? 50. Now, in the time before May 24th, 2019, did you see your daughter often? Yes. Did you speak to her often? Yes. Did you see your grandchildren often? Yes. Now, on May 24th, 2019, did you have plans to see Jennifer? Yes, I did. What were those plans? Well, she was going to meet us at my apartment. Is that in the city? In the city, in New York City. And were the children coming as well? 
Yes, they were. And did the children show up at your apartment that day? Yes, they did. Who brought them? Um, Lauren Almeida. Now, was Jennifer supposed to come to your apartment to meet you and the children there? Yes. Did Jennifer show up at your apartment that day? No. Have you seen your daughter Jennifer since she failed to meet you at your apartment in New York City on May 24th, 2019? No. Have you spoken to her on the phone since that no, day? No, I have not. Have you gotten any emails or text messages or any communication from your daughter since that no. day? No. I'm sorry, you have to speak up. Quick. No. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jennifer's five children, uh, when was the oldest one born? Uh, April 20th, um, 2006, so by you, four minutes, because two, they're twins. So oh. the oldest one is Petros. So it was four minutes apart between so, Petros and Theodore. So the oldest by four minutes? Yes. Okay. In 2006? Yes. Between 2006 and 2019, did Jennifer ever miss one of her children's birthdays? Never. Uh, and the children celebrate their name days, right, under the Greek culture? Yes, they did. Did Jennifer ever miss a name day between 2006 and 2019? Yes. Was she always there for them? Pardon? Was Jennifer always there for them? Yes, she was always there. And uh, as of now, uh, 2024, do you have custody of the five children? I do. And since May 24th, uh, 2019, have any of the children ever seen or spoken to their mother? No. I have nothing further. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, Mrs. Barber. Good morning. I just have a few questions for you, if I may. Can you hear me okay? I do. Was... Um, Jennifer's plan to come to New York by herself or with the children? By herself, because she dropped the children off at the New Canaan Country Day School. And the children uh, did come with Lauren to New York that day to, yes. to your apartment? Yes. Were they there at about 12 or 1 in the afternoon? I'd say about 12 or 1, yes. Did you um, reach out by telephone to... Uh, Jennifer, the day before she came to New York. Objection. Ground. Outside the scope, Your Honor. It is outside of the scope. Well, it's a preliminary to the plans of her coming to New York, Your Honor. Well, uh, the objection is sustained, but you can continue with the line of questioning. Did you make plans with Jennifer to... Um, have her come to New York the next day? Did she share that with you? Yes, she did. Did she mention she was first going to a doctor's appointment that morning? Objection, Your Honor. Well, the court allowed the question concerning plans, and so this is a follow-up on plans overruled. Do you remember the question, ma'am? Did she have plans to visit a doctor? Before she came to your apartment? Yes. Do you remember if it was a Dr. Geronimus that she was going to see that Yes. Morning? And did you, um, as part of your making plans with her, did you try to call her the day before to confirm those plans in the afternoon? Objection, Your Honor. Well, now the line of questioning goes from what was the plan to... Did you try to confirm the plans? And so the court is going to sustain the objection. Did you speak at all to Jennifer that morning of the 24th? No. Did you call, did you call her on her cell phone? No. Objection, Your Honor. Well, the... Answer to the question was, did you speak to Jennifer that morning? The answer was no. The court understands the second question to be, did you attempt to contact her that morning? 
You may ask the question again. Right. Did you attempt to, to contact her that morning? No. Did you have her phone number at the time? Of course. Do you recall what that number is today? Objection, Your Honor. Sustain. I have no further questions. I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Barber, you may step down. Thank you. State rest, Your Honor. So, ladies and gentlemen, what that means is the state at this time rests its case. The state, if the defense puts on witnesses, the state has an opportunity, if it so chooses, to present rebuttal witnesses. But as of right now, the state rests its case. The court has to take up at this point legal arguments. And if the defense has witnesses ready to be called after those legal arguments, we will resume the session. So please do not discuss the case. And we probably are going to be in a much longer recess than normal. Are there defense witnesses ready for today, Attorney Sean? Yes, Your Honor. Are, are they ready this morning? Um, we were instruct. We were informed that the they would arrive by eleven. We didn't know how long the uh, state's case would take. Thank you. So we'll stand in our recess, uh, ladies and gentlemen, until eleven o'clock. Defense has an opportunity to argue its motion for judgment of acquittal. That motion was filed yesterday, February 20th. Yes, and I'll note that originally we thought the state would complete yesterday. So even though it's dated yesterday, it's to take effect at this point now that the state is rested. Thank you. Um, I move to uh, for the court to grant the judgment of acquittal on each of the uh, present charges, each count separately, and I will just go through each of them. The state has um, presented, and again, the, the standard for a motion for judgment of acquittal is there any evidence that a, that the jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that the state has met its burden on each and every element of the offense charge. Let me just begin where I will concede that there is sufficient evidence of certain elements that would have to be resolved by the uh, jury. So, for example, I believe the state has been able to show that a jury could find that Jennifer Dulos is deceased. We would also concede from, for again, for purposes of this motion, that the uh, death of Miss of Miss Farber Dulos was either induced by or caused by Fotis Dulos, either directly or indirectly. What I submit that the state has failed to establish is whether the that death <coughs> was caused by the specific under the common law, we call malice aforethought, which means intentional uh, killing of another individual under the um, statute providing for the elements of murder. That, however, even if the state 
could do that, even if the state can argue that there's sufficient evidence to show that Fotostoulos planned the outcome that occurred. We have to also remember, Your Honor, that much of the state's evidence is based on this presumptive testing, which I note under State versus Moody, in and of itself fails to provide any evidentiary value whatsoever. So even though the jury and the court hasn't yet fully instructed the jury, the, the court made some comment to the jury about what it's allowed for. But Luminol and uh, Castle Meyer are not evidence of blood. So the fact that there's been a lot of testimony about that, it's in the interrogation videos. It was the sub subject of many witnesses' testimony. It does not provide any basis for the court or for any fact finder to determine that that was in fact blood. And for reasons that we still don't know, the only three, there were only three items that were tested and we concede one of them being the shirt and the other being the, um, the bra. Um, and I forget what the third one is right now, but there was one other place where they did test uh, and it was determined to actually be not just a blood-like substance or something that tested uh, under a presumptive test, but was in fact blood. The um, problem with the state's theory of this case, and as it was presented, is that the state spent a month or more trying to prove that Fotis Dulos killed his wife. None of that, however, none of that evidence pointed to Ms. Traconis as being a party to that plan, that design, or the acts involving the of the death itself, or this, the cover-up afterwards, I would readily concede that the court proved that Fotis Dulos was involved in the covering up of a crime. Whether that crime was murder, as the state alleges, or some other crime, again, the way it's been charged, that it could only be murder. It cannot be manslaughter. It cannot be a, a reckless death. Uh, during a fight or a struggle, it has to be murder because that's the way the state charged this uh, offense under count one. In fact, the way they charged it is they say that Fotis Dulos, quote, did assault Jennifer Farber Dulos in her home on the 24th day of May 2019 with the intent to restrain and kill her in violation of sections 53A, 48A, and 53A, 54A, subsection A. I will note there has been no evidence from any source of any restraint, but let's just assume that there's still enough uh, uh, to at least allege that there was an intent to kill, even if I submit the evidence doesn't support that. But now we get to the question in count one of conspiracy. Under our law, under Connecticut General Statute uh, 48A, the, um, the state must demonstrate essentially uh, four things. One being the underlying purpose being to restrain and kill Jennifer Dolos. The first question is they have to prove that Michelle Traconis intended to commit that crime, the specific crime of murder. Two, that there was an agreement between Michelle Traconis and Fotis Dulos to commit that crime of murder. Three, that the specific intent was to restrain and or kill, and kill, not or, uh, Jennifer Dulos. And four, the, uh, it, there was an actual agreement to do those things together. Now, the state has alleged uh, that the defendant agreed with other persons, quote unquote, to engage in these crimes. The state was not required to, act, to actually place in their information who those other people were. We've heard the names of possible other individuals. There was Kent Mawinney. Uh, there was Andreas Kutziardis. There was even Pavel Gumieni as people that may have committed acts that might be considered certainly suspicious, but the state made no effort to demonstrate that Michelle Traconis 
agreed with any of them to commit an offense. I now want to just talk about the count. Basically, I'm going to not repeat what I'm saying about the crime of conspiracy, other than conspiracy is a specific intent crime. Not only do you have to prove the underlying elements that the defendant was involved in, but that she had a specific <coughs> intent to agree to commit those offenses in advance. And if one looks at the, and, and I'll start with then with count two. Count two specifically alleges that Michelle Traconis entered into a conspiracy on 24th of May, 2019, in the area of Albany Avenue in Hartford, to commit the crime of tampering with physical evidence with the intent that conduct constituting the, that crime be performed, and did agree with Fotis Doulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct. And one of them, I would submit the only other one is Fotis Doulos, did commit an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. It goes on to say that Michelle Traconis traveled with Fotis Doulos to the Harvard area for the purpose of disposal, disposal of physical evidence relating to the murder of Jennifer Farber Doulos in Hartford on May 24, 2019. That's the allegation that's been submitted. I submit there is no knowledge, no evidence whatsoever that Michelle Traconis either agreed to do that or had any idea what was going on, what Mr. Doulos was doing. We've spent I don't know how many hours of, uh, of interrogation video. She never, so, so we start with the fact she said absolutely nothing that would constitute admission to any knowledge of that. To the contrary, she repeatedly, over the course of months, denied any knowledge as to what Doulos was up to. So what, are we, what is the evidence with regard to that? We do know, let's work backwards, the police did not come to the home of, of um, Dulos and Mr. Conus until eight, approximately 8.30 the night of May 24, 2019. The testimony is they came to the house and told uh, Mr. Dulos, and my client heard part of this, that Jennifer Dulos was missing. This, of course, is after they were in Hartford at, at, on Albany Avenue. So we have black garbage bags, opaque garbage bags. We see Mr. Dulos placing them in various receptacles. Only one of them, incidentally, contained any items of evidentiary value to this case, the ones where the, the two garbage bags, the, the, the shirt, the bra, a number of other items that were found with blood on them. But they weren't in garbage bags. It was spread among whatever trash was in that barrel. But be that as it may, the evidence is uncontested that it was Fotostulos who got out, took the garbage, and threw them in those uh, barrels. This is prior to the, any time that Michelle Traconis would even know that there was a, um, uh, a crime that may have occurred and that there was an investigation that was beginning. So in order to be guilty of tampering with physical evidence, it specifically requires under the statute, that believe, under um, 53A-155, that the defendant would have to believe that a criminal investigation conducted by law enforcement or an, uh, is pending or about to be instituted. And, there, and it claims that she either destroyed, concealed, or removed anything for the purpose of impairing its ability uh, to be used in the criminal investigation. Again, the only evidence is that she only even learned that there was an investigation afterwards at 8.30 at night after they had been to Albany Avenue, after they'd been to Starbucks, and then they went home. So I submit that there is zero evidence in the record to allow any reasonable trier fact, any, to conclude that she engaged in that conduct or agreed in advance to that conduct, uh, either substantively or in a conspiracy to commit that crime in the absence of any evidence that she knew there was a criminal investigation uh, at all, or that even one was being uh, instituted. If I may um, move on. 
I will also note, Your Honor, that uh, there's a lot of cases that specifically say that um, mere presence or even acquiescence in the conduct of uh, someone else is not evidence of a crime. And a jury has to be instructed that that cannot be used as the basis. There has to actually be affirmative evidence. Merely being present under our law is not a basis to uh, convict anyone of any crime, even if they're sitting there while someone else is engaged in activity, in obvious activity in their presence. Um, count three is the substantive offense of tampering with physical evidence, again, under 53A, 155A1. It is charged as accessory under 53A-8. I note that under our law, the crime of ex accessory and the principal crime are the same. They are two manners of committing the same crime. But the way it's been charged here, it indicates that um, simply that she committed the substantive crime. I guess there is zero evidence that she did that. She didn't touch anything that's connected to a crime in the city of Hartford on May 24th, 2019. I will note, Your Honor, there is, I'm anticipating what the state's going to say, well, there were three cells of partial DNA of Mr. Conus found on the exterior of the, of the um, opening of the bag, so the place where you would hold it, you grab a bag, might pull it out of a, of a um, box, but it was partial, and the state did not test either Mr. Cronus's mother or her daughter, who also lived in the home, even if they can assume that these garbage bags came from that box of trash, of trash bags <coughs> that was seized from the home itself. There's an interesting recent Connecticut Supreme Court case on this that Your Honor should be at least uh, aware of that I want to cite, State versus Dawson at 340 Connecticut, 136, 2021. That is a case where there was a, um, a firearm uh, discovered where there were in the immediate vicinity of three or four individuals. And the Supreme Court in that case ruled in 2021 that DNA evidence standing alone does not establish that a defendant had dominion or control over that weapon. So they reversed the conviction saying the presence of DNA, and they went into this issue of um, partial DNA, the number of picograms, uh, the idea of transfer DNA. They say that is not enough to convict anybody. And I submit that that is precisely where we're going with this particular uh, case here and the suggestion that three cells that are a partial match to Mr. Conus cannot be the basis for such a finding with regard to that charge. Now let's move then to counts four, five, and six, which all relate to uh, the Russell Speeder, Speeder car wash in, um, in Avon, which is where the state alleges. So we're talking about the, not we're talking about what happened in Mountain Spring Road, that is not the charge. The fact that Mr. Dulos handed Ms. Traconis a, uh, a paper towel that did not smell like anything that she put in a garbage bag is not what they're charging here. It's according to the, uh, the way this case was charged, it was, it says that she, um, that she both tampered with and hindered the prosecution by, did agree with Fotis Dulos by transporting, transporting the 2001 Toyota Tacoma used in the commission of the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos to Russell Speeder's car wash for the purpose of having evidence relating to that murder concealed and destroyed. The count five tampering specifically indi in, uh, indicates that believing that the criminal investigation was pending or about to be instituted, altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed a thing with the purpose of impairing its, its availability in the criminal investigation. And finally, under hindering, it render criminal assistance, as that is defined, to another person uh, 
that, that she believed committed a murder. I mean, it specifically committed a class A felony to wit murder, did provide photos to list with transportation and other means of avoiding discovery and apprehension. Well, even that is baseless here, Your Honor, because she did not provide transportation to Mr. Dulos to bring the vehicle there. The only testimony is that she followed outside in a separate vehicle, I guess on May 29th, which is what the allegations are here, uh, and then picked him up at the car wash. The only reasonable interpretation is she was somewhere outside not even visible. He had to call her on the phone to come get him. And of course, this is after the vehicle has been brought in. And she, then the testimony is, they then together drove down to Attorney Bowman's office in Westport. And then when he came back, we had the video. Mr. Dulos obtained some cash and went inside and paid for the detailing after it was done. There is no evidence that Mr. Conus had anything to do with that. There's no evidence that she had any uh, involvement in that bank account, that, it had, that she even would have known what he was taking out and for what purpose. He went in alone to have the car detailed and washed. He alone went in to have it, uh, to pay for it after the fact. And I just want to also clarify because, you know, it took a little bit. So we got Detective Clabby yesterday to admit it. I'm sorry, Detective uh, Kimball to admit it. But even Mr. Dulles did not falsely give information about the Toyota Tacoma to the aide, that in fact, the, uh, the employee had mistakenly written the phone number on the line of a vehicle that came at 844 in the morning and then rewrote it on the line below where it didn't indicate the name of the person who was bringing in that vehicle. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't need to repeat, you know, for each of the crimes, you have the same elements for hindering. It requires, all require specific intent. Um, they have to specifically show that the purpose was to commit a, a specifically a crime, a class A or B felony, that she had to be aware of that. Uh, in this case, it had to be uh, by the way the case was charged. Murder, not any other crime. Not any other crime. There's just one other. And I'll note when I refer to the log sheet, Your Honor, I'm referring to States Exhibit 138, the Russell Speeder um, log that was introduced and in which um, I showed as well to Mr. Kimball yesterday. So I just want to have a moment. I know that, and I'm just going to say this for the record. Um, I know that Judge Blowey denied this, but I want to incorporate my arguments about vicinage and venue for my judgment of acquittal in the case that vicinage is a requirement of the uh, location of the crime. And that um, all of these crimes, all of them, including the conspiracy, all occurred in the Hartford Judicial District. I stated for the record, I'm not asking uh, the court, well, I would ask the court to, I don't want the record to suggest that I've waived the issue. So I raise it now so that the court is aware uh, that I'm making that also part of my judgment of acquittal argument um, at this time. Let me just look at my notes for a moment, Your Honor. Oh, um, when I made the comment about um, mere presence as an act, inactive companion, passive acquiescence, or the doing of innocent acts which may, in fact, aid the one who commits the crime, must be distinguished from the criminal intent and community of unlawful purpose shared by one who knowingly and willfully assists the perpetrator of the offense in the acts which prepare for, facilitate, or consummate it. Um, that's from uh, State versus Anano, which goes back to 96 Connecticut 420. It's also uh, cited in um, State versus Pundy, P-U-N-D-Y, at 147 Connecticut 7, where the court went on to say that uh, those who simply are companions in passive acquiescence uh, may be said to be innocent of any wrongdoing. 
Just want to check my notes one more time. I'm just going to mention in case the state, instead of standing up a second time, I'm going to just mention Pinkerton liability in case that's one of the state's arguments. That doesn't apply here. And I uh, will note that um, under, the, under Pinkerton, such cases as State versus Bennett at 307 Connecticut 758, which cites to the Pinkerton decision at 328 U.S. 640, um, require a community of criminal intent and community of unlawful purpose with the perpetrator of the crime and must be knowingly and willfully done to assist the perpetrator in the acts which prepare for, facilitate, or consummate it. Uh, under those cases, Your Honor, and there's um, numerous cases that now deal with state, uh, the Pinkerton liability, that applies when if somebody is going to rob a bank and they conspire in advance to rob the bank, and there's evidence of that conspiracy, but one of the co-conspirators pulls out a gun and either shoots someone or at least threatens the gun, co-conspirator can say, well, I didn't know he had a weapon. But under Pinkerton liability, if it's within the furtherance and it can be um, believed to be a likely alternative or outcome, that that could happen if you're going to rob a bank, there's, a, it, there's an inference that it may be probable somebody may be armed. You can be held liable to the more, ex, uh, what's the best way to put this? to the enhanced penalties or the aggravated fact, aggravating factor that would be contemplated within the crime accused. But you have to go back to knowing what was happening in the first place. If you go to the bank, for example, to make a deposit and the person you're with robs the bank, pulls out a gun and robs the bank, if there's no evidence of an agreement, you're there just to make a deposit, that could not then subject the person to Pinkerton liability merely because uh, he or she was present. In other words, it doesn't shift that liability and, and do away with the requirement of, of concert and uh, concerted effort and, and uh, uh, agreement to commit the crime. Well, the touchstone of Pinkerton is foreseeability, correct? I'm sorry, Your Honor? The touchstone of Pinkerton is foreseeability. Foreseeability, yes, Your Honor. And of course, uh, and I also, when I read Pinkerton, it's not only just foreseeability that one of the people will do something else, but you are already committing a crime. Um, it is not foreseeable that if you go into the bank, a friend of yours may commit a robbery. It's that you agreed in advance. It's just that it's foreseeable that maybe that other person that you already agreed to commit the crime with did something more egregious than simply ask for money and hand up a note. So it's, it's, that's the claim that I'm making with regard to that. There was just one other point, Your Honor, um, that I wanted to make before I sit down. I, I'm just going to ask the court, there are a couple other cases that have come out that I wanted the court to look at on the issue of uh, in, under... Um, with uh, tampering, for example, and they are State versus um, Knox, KNOX 201 Connecticut, uh, Appellate 457 in 2021, and they talk about um, State versus Jordan, which is in 2014, 314 Connecticut, 354. They talk about that the, that's where it specifically says, even though the statute is not as clear, that you had to have acted with the intent to prevent the use of the evidence at an official proceeding or criminal investigation. And it uh, construes in that respect the difference between that case and State versus Forshaw, F-O-R-E-S-H-A-W, at 214 Connecticut 540, where there was some debate between whether it was a requirement or not. And I submit the Jordan case and then the Knox case make that clear. I also want to make one other last argument here. There is going to be some evidence suggested by the state that 
if Ms. Draconis made false statements or intentionally made false statements, which, of course, we dispute, but let's assume that based on the testimony, the jury could find that she made false statements during the interrogations. That evidence, Your Honor, was admitted for purposes of um, arguably consciousness of guilt. And we will be submitting a jury instruction that they have to first find that it was intentionally false as opposed to um, um, based on either mistake, misremembering, being coerced, all those things that we've talked about. But the case law on conscious of guilt makes clear, and the judge must instruct the jury, that consciousness of guilt is not evidence of the crime itself. So they would have, the state would have to prove separately that the defendant, that there was sufficient element of the crime in each element of the crime, and then apply whether, I'll use flight as the example. If a person runs away when the police come and somewhere in a group of people they find drugs, that fact of somebody running away is not evidence that the individual possessed those drugs or possessed it with the intent to sell. It's admissible to show a guilty conscience. And that would only be admissible if there was separately sufficient evidence of the underlying crime beyond reasonable doubt or crimes. Just one moment, Your Honor. Oh, the other case on Pinkerton that I wanted to cite was um, State versus Patel, which is the uh, appellate court case, 194 Con App 245, 2019. And then uh, I'll also cite to the elements for conspiracy to commit murder, State versus Balbuena, B-A-L-B-U-E-N-A, which is um, 168 Con App 194. 2016, and um, conspiracy to commit murder, State versus Pinnock, P-I-N-N-O-C-K, at 220 Connecticut 765. Based on that, Your Honor, I asked that on each of the counts, I'm sorry, I, I thought it was done, I realized one other thing. There are three separate conspiracy charges charged here. I submit that the state has not shown any three separate agreements under any theory, and at the very minimum, the court is required, based on the evidence, to grant the judgment of acquittal as to two of them. And uh, the way I understand the law, the court can leave in the most serious one, which would be the conspiracy to commit murder if the court does not agree with my other arguments. But the court must, based on the uh, on the case law, on the issue of, due, of multiplicity of charges, they have not shown there were separate conspiracies at any time. They haven't shown any conspiracies at all, but they certainly haven't shown there are separate conspiracies. And based on all of that, Your Honor, I ask specifically, just on this last argument, that the court grant the uh, judgment of acquittal as to count two, count four, as a separate argument. Thank you. Your Honor, good morning and may it please the court. Your Honor, the uh, defendant's argument seems to be that we have a different interpretation of the evidence and therefore grant us an acquittal. But of course, as the court knows, that is not the standard that the court needs to apply here. The court has to view the evidence in the light most favorable to the state as part of this motion, including drawing all reasonable inferences that a jury could find in favor of guilt. Thank you. Including drawing all reasonable inferences that a jury could find in making a finding of guilt. So I want to just begin with uh, the argument that the state has proven that Mr. Dulos is responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death, but that somehow the state has not presented sufficient evidence for a jury to find that uh, it was actually an intentional killing. Um, that is completely belied by the facts of this case, Your Honor. The, a reasonable jury can draw the following inferences. Number one, <clears throat> Mr. Dulos was motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos based on the fact that they were involved in a highly contentious divorce. Mr. Dulos drove his employee's Toyota Tacoma to New Canaan to commit this crime. 
He attacked Jennifer Dulos in her in his garage and killed her with at least two blows. It's been about a month, but you'll recall, Judge, we had the blood pattern expert who came in and indicated that there were at least two blows which were delivered in this case based on the direction of the blood pattern. By the way, the fact that he was in New Canaan in the first instance, Your Honor, is evidence of his intent because he had no reason to be down there. The children did not have visitation on that day. And um, the fact that he went down there in the first instance is evidence of his intent, including the fact that he took his employee's vehicle. State versus Moody um, does not stand for the proposition that the defense keeps citing. State versus Moody, or I know the court knows this, but it's the totality of the evidence in this case that is the dispositive factor, including the fact that all of those presumptive blood tests subsequently tested positive for Jennifer Dulos's blood. So that's the, um, the compelling factor in this particular instance. A reasonable jury can also find that Jennifer Dulos was transported from her home by Mr. Dulos and her body was disposed of in some manner, which again goes to the intent in committing the crime in the first instance. A reasonable jury can find that her clothing was removed by Mr. Dulos and disposed of in the trash in Albany Avenue, thus demonstrating his connection to the blood, the clothing, and his act of murder. And I would just cite the court to State versus Richards, 196, Con App 387. The state does not need to prove the cause of death in a murder case merely that it was proved, merely that it was caused by criminal means. So in other words, the fact that the body has not been recovered um, does not mean that a jury can't find that there was homicidal violence in this case, particularly when you combine the blood pattern evidence with the cut clothing, with the, uh, the fact of animus towards Jennifer Dulos and Mr. Dulos's DNA in a mixture of blood with Jennifer Dulos's DNA on that faucet. Now, counsel will say, well, there was no confirmatory test done. That's not the test. It's not whether or not a confirmatory test was done. The test is whether or not a reasonable jury could find so here you have Mr. Dulos's DNA mixed on the faucet with Jennifer Dulos's DNA. It's a blood-like stain that tests positive for blood, which is strong evidence of his guilt. Now, that is, of course, evidence of Mr. Dulos's intent, but let's talk about the evidence of the defendant's intent. I would direct the court to State versus Soini, 180 Con App 205. That was a conspiracy to commit murder case, and, and the court in Soini specifically talked about one of the factors, uh, of course, for a jury to consider is whether or not somebody who is alleged to have entered into a conspiracy would have been motivated to enter into that conspiracy. So let's talk about all the evidence of the defendant's motive that the state has established during the course of this case. And I would just note also that um, there is no requirement in a conspiracy case that the state present a witness who comes in and says, I agreed or I heard an agreement it can absolutely be proven by circumstantial evidence based on the fact that conspiracies by their very nature are done in secret. And there's a whole line of cases, Your Honor, that stand for that proposition. So the evidence of the defendant's motive here, obviously, number one, her boyfriend is in a contentious divorce with Jennifer Dulos at the time. In part, incidentally, due to the fact that the defendant and Mr. Dulos had an affair and Jennifer Dulos left the house shortly thereafter with the children. They were in a custody battle that necessitated the defendant having to leave the home whenever Mr. Dulos had visitation. She was not to be allowed around the children. During her interview, the defendant actually said that this had been two years of torture. She talked about applying for a restraining order against Ms. Dulos. She discussed the fact that her relationship with Mr. Dulos was suffering as a result, and in fact, the defendant told Mike Meehan that she had not moved to Connecticut for this. The defendant also told investigators that she was prepared to leave Mr. Dulos as early as two, December 2018, and the jury can infer that she was going to leave because of the fact that this divorce proceeding was driving a wedge into her relationship with Mr. Dulos. The defendant was obviously, a jury can infer, extremely upset and motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos, as evidenced by the fact that she stated when referring to Jennifer Dulos, that that bitch should be buried next to the dog, thus demonstrating severe animus towards Jennifer Dulos and explicitly referencing her death a month or so leading up to Jennifer Dulos' disappearance. And even after Jennifer's disappearance, 
the defendant's animus towards Jennifer Dulos continued, as evidenced by the fact that she told Pavel Gamini that she was going to, quote, kill Jennifer when she turned up. Now, the defense will say, well, that proves she didn't know. The jury doesn't have to accept that. The jury can accept that as merely a self-serving statement in an effort to cover up her involvement in the crime, but while still expressing severe animus towards Jennifer Dulos. The jury can also infer, Your Honor, reasonably that the defendant had advanced knowledge of the murder and actively tried to help Mr. Dulos with his false alibi. After all, the defendant was home at the time or the approximate time of the murder and purposely, the jury can infer, answered his phone to help establish his alibi, as evidenced by the fact that Mr. Dulos wrote in his alibi script that he initially answered the phone. The phone call, of course, was from Mr. Dulos's friend, who subsequently refused to cooperate in the investigation, and that call, according to the data, had been arranged the day before. The defendant, of course, did not mention this call in her first two interviews, and in fact, indicated in the second interview that she had not seen Mr. Dulos's phone at all. The defendant actively lied about Mr. Dulos's whereabouts on the morning of the crime, even after being told that Mr. Dulos was responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death. And the evidence is, if Mr. Dulos was in New Canaan killing Jennifer Dulos, which the defense has essentially conceded, although they don't concede the intent, that the defendant was home alone with Mr. Dulos's phone and manipulating it. That's the evidence. She's unlocking the phone, she's playing with the phone at times when Mr. Dulos is in New Canaan. And that, again, is something the jury can draw a reasonable inference that this whole thing with the phone call was a planned event. The defendant was in possession of his phone, waiting for the call that had been prearranged the night before. The jury can also infer, Your Honor, consciousness of guilt based on the fact that the defendant actively assisted Mr. Dulos in attempting to conceal evidence of the crime, thus demonstrating a consciousness of guilt with respect to the conspiracy to commit murder. And that, of course, serves as the basis for counts two through six. The defendant, incidentally, says that the, the court at this point needs to make a finding that it was one conspiracy. They cited no case for that proposition, Your Honor. It's just simply false. Um, a reasonable jury could reject some or all of these counts, and it's up to the jury to decide whether or not um, the state has proven each element of each crime beyond reasonable doubt. They cite no case for that proposition whatsoever. But nonetheless, those counts... The uh, defendant, I guess, was claiming that because the state didn't indicate uh, evidence of others being involved in the crime, number one, that's not true because we have the testimony regarding Mr. Dulos' friend making the phone call, not cooperating, but also not required for conspiracy to commit murder. The only thing we have to prove, Your Honor, is that she agreed with one or more persons. That's the state of the law. So it's false to say that we somehow had to prove that she conspired with other people besides Mr. Dulos. <clears throat> With respect to the uh, tampering counts, Judge, we have charged her uh, under an accessorial liability with respect to that. Um, the test is essentially that the defendant believed an official proceeding or criminal investigation was pending or about to be instituted, helped Mr. Dulos discard the evidence at issue and acted with the intent to prevent use of evidence at an official proceeding or criminal investigation. I'll direct the court to State versus Forsaw, which is 214 Con 540. In that case, evidence that the defendant had discarded a murder weapon before any contact with police officers or the judicial system was sufficient to convict the defendant of tampering with evidence. So there's no requirement, Your Honor, that actually an official proceeding ever begin or the timing of it, merely that the defendant believed one was about to be initiated. So what can the jury find with respect to counts two and three? A reasonable jury could find the following, that the defendant agreed to assist Mr. Dulos in the destruction of physical evidence and assisted him based on the following. She was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road shortly after the Tacoma arrived and drove back and forth several times. Your Honor, I apologize. Uh, the state may interpret us have a moment. We were having a technical issue. Certainly.
May I proceed? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. A reasonable jury can find that she was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road shortly after the Tacoma arrived back and after the, this crime was committed, and that she drove back and forth several times. A reasonable jury can find that she believed a police investigation was about to begin and that she was actively helping Mr. Dulos, as evidenced by the fact that she brought cleaning supplies. A reasonable jury can find that she accompanied Mr. Dulos to Hartford and was present as he disposed of those items and that she actually assisted him in the disposal of the license plates by opening her door at the exact moment that he opened his door and left it open until he dumped those license plates in the sewer. If you look at the video very carefully, Judge, what you're going to see is a vehicle there that she's attempting to block, and a reasonable jury can make that finding. She's trying to block the view of that particular vehicle. A reasonable jury can find she was aware of what was in the construction bags as evidenced by her many lies about the entire day, including the fact that she was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road and was going back and forth repeatedly and apparently lighting fires, which is again consistent with the destruction of evidence. She actively assisted in the cleanup process prior to going to Hartford, including bringing cleaning supplies, which incidentally were consistent with those which were found in Hartford including a green and yellow sponge, a broom or a mop handle, and black garbage bags, all found in Hartford that the defendant admitted to bringing to 80 Mountain Spring Road. The defendant's DNA is located on the opening of a bag that tested positive for blood, had Jennifer Dulos's DNA, and had duct tape, and was found amongst other bags matched to Jennifer Dulos's untimely death, specifically a bag that contained a bloody shirt and bra confirmed to be human blood that was forensically linked to the DNA of Jennifer Dulos. With respect to counts five and six, Judge, a reasonable jury could find that the Tacoma was used in the commission of this crime and the defendant assisted Mr. Dulos in his effort to conceal evidence found within and upon the Tacoma. As the court knows, the Tacoma was viewed on video surveillance leaving 80 Mountain Spring Road in the early morning hours. It was tracked on surveillance footage heading down to the New Canaan area. It was parked near Waveney Park in the general area where Jennifer's Suburban was found. Approximately 40 minutes or so after Jennifer's Suburban was viewed leaving her residence, the Tacoma was seen traveling north on the Merritt Parkway where it essentially tracked right back to 80 Mountain Spring Road. A reasonable jury can conclude that evidence relating to the crime of Jennifer Dulos was inside of that vehicle based on, number one, her blood being present, and yes, they can make that finding on one of the seats. The defendant's acknowledgement that Dulos was cleaning the vehicle, and Dulos's paranoia and insistence that Mr. Gamini get rid of the seats from the Tacoma. Moreover, a reasonable jury can conclude that the defendant was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during the cleanup of the Tacoma, and in fact, admitted to assisting Mr. Dulos throw away a paper towel that apparently was being used to clean the Tacoma. The fact that she says it's coffee is not dispositive. The jury can merely view this as a self-serving statement, especially in light of all the other evidence in her lies. The defendant took the keys to the Tacoma, and a reasonable jury can conclude that she took the keys to the Tacoma because she understood that Mr. Dulos had used it in the commission of the crime, and they wanted to keep the Tacoma in Farmington so that they could continue their efforts to clean up. The defendant drove in tandem with Mr. Dulos to the car wash, knowing that he was going to wash the car in an effort to conceal evidence of the crime. Again, a reasonable jury can make that finding, especially given that she initially tried to sort of fudge those facts to the police and lie about it and say that he called her to come pick him up. And then when she's pressed, she says, oh, well, maybe we went together. The Tacoma was extremely clean when it was found by investigators. So clean, in fact, that despite the fact that it was an 18-year-old work vehicle, there were numerous places where there was no DNA profiles at all, thus showing evidence of the destruction of evidence in the cleanup. DNA expert Kristen Maydell testified that DNA can be destroyed by wiping it or using water or shampoo. Thus, a reasonable jury can conclude that there was evidence destroyed in connection with this case. The defendant also showed consciousness of guilt with respect to this by not telling investigators that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road, thus demonstrating her understanding that this was used in the commission of the crime during her first two interviews. The defendant also failed to tell the police 
that this vehicle had been washed during the first two interviews, again, demonstrating consciousness of guilt. With respect to the hindering count, Your Honor, obviously um, the defendant, by following Mr. Dulos out, meeting him at the car wash, and a reasonable jury can infer that she understood that the crime of murder had been committed. Incidentally, this is five days later, um, but certainly, Judge, uh, a reasonable jury can infer based on all the evidence that she understood that that vehicle was evidence of a crime. And she picks him up and provides transportation, essentially through the use of her vehicle, back to the car wash so that these things can be done. And she also, um, coincidentally, her phone number is the number that is used on the call log, which again, a reasonable jury can view as an effort to distance Mr. Dulos from the car wash. Perhaps they thought that she wasn't under investigation, even if he was. And again, a reasonable jury can make all of these findings. So, Your Honor, um, again, this isn't a motion about we have a different interpretation of the evidence. That's what closing argument is for. The question for this court is, has the state presented sufficient evidence for mm -hmm. to proceed? And of course we have, Your Honor, based on our argument. Does the court have any questions? Yes. The court is reviewing the information that the court read to the jury. That information was filed on or about October 5th, 2023. The court is reviewing count five. <coughs> I apologize, Your Honor. I don't have a copy in front of me. If I just... Sure. Thanks. And the information reads, the court is just going to read the pertinent part. On the 29th day of May 2019 in the town of Avon in the area of 265 West Main Street, that being Russell Speeders. The defendant, Michelle Tacon, is believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, and an official proceeding was pending and about to be instituted, did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose of impairing its availability. What evidence did the state introduce on that count? Yes, sir. The uh, evidence is the car wash itself, and, and if I may just be heard on this because I did hear attorney Schoenhorn's argument, but um, we charged her as an accessory in this particular account, your honor. And I know that I didn't think that this was going to be an issue, but I'm happy to provide the court with the case law. But essentially by putting the accessory statute, we put the defendant on notice that that is a theory that we are pursuing. And so the court needs to view that count in light of that allegation that she was an accessory. And so the fact that the Tacoma itself was brought to the car wash, if a reasonable jury can infer that the Tacoma itself was used in a crime, then the jury can infer that she aided Mr. Dulos in the tampering of that evidence by providing him with transportation, by allowing her phone number to be used, and that the destruction of evidence happened. So there is no requirement, Your Honor, based on the way that we've charged this, that we prove that she actually um, altered the evidence herself because we've charged her under an accessorial liability theory. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I just want to respond to a couple of things. Um, I'm actually a little surprised to hear Mr. Uh, McGinnis say that um, the luminol was tested and confirmed to be blood on all these items. That's simply untrue. There were three items total that were tested. None of the others were tested. This all goes back to um, the suggestion they can infer if it's blood from that is not only improper, but I submit that if they argue that point to the jury, that's considered pro prosecutorial misconduct based on that. So I submit that that's just a erroneous uh, statement. With regard to um, this, the, the bold assertion that Mr. Dulos was in New Canaan that day, and so therefore he wasn't home. I submit there's no proof of that. We concede he had something to do 
with a plan, but they cannot prove that it was Mr. Dulos who was there on May 24th, in light of the fact he was there on May 22nd. And therefore, they cannot, uh, as I cited, I don't even hear the state uh, referring to that recent uh, Connecticut Supreme Court case on, uh, on DNA that I just cited a few minutes ago. So, uh, and about transfer DNA. But be that as it may, there is not uh, evidence that all of these other items were tested and found to be positive for Jennifer Dulos's blood. If there's evidence of homicidal, uh, uh, of, ha, ha, let me rephrase that, evidence of a homicide, that does not prove intent. That doesn't improve murder. <clears throat> it improves an untimely death. And um, a motive, even if a motive exists, is not equal to a conspiracy. There may be a lot of people that you might wish ill will to, but in the absence of either knowledge or actual overt action, it doesn't translate that into finding, well, if you don't like somebody, that's the motive to, uh, to kill them. Uh, the argument that she, quote, actively concealed, unquote, evidence of the crime is also completely speculative and made up. The fact that there was a fire in a fireplace during the afternoon, the suggestion they can say, well, she must be burning evidence of a crime. She must know that there is a crime being committed, that therefore the fact that there's a fire in her fireplace is proof of that, I submit would be pure speculation. In fact, half of what I just heard is speculation upon speculation upon speculation. Um, I would note that Mr. Uh, Kumieni, for example, did not identify the red truck uh, that was on the side of Latham Road as being his. The only time he identified a vehicle as looking like his was somewhere on the Merritt Parkway. There's the one angle from the rest stop on the, and I can't remember as I'm standing here whether that was Fairfield um, or New Canaan, but I believe it was Fairfield where he said yes because it has that um, bar in the front. We recognize that. None of the others are identified by Mr. Umiani as being uh, his vehicle. So I submit there is no evidence that that's the truck on the road. What's more important and kind of interesting, Your Honor, there's no evidence of when the Chevy Suburban ended up on Latham Road until 8.30 p.m. when it was discovered by the police. There is zero evidence it was there during the day. There's no vehicle. There's no one who passed by that saw it. There's no cameras from any buses that show it there at any other time. And we do have evidence that her, that a phone that's been paired to that, um, that vehicle um, since 2018, and which the evidence shows she was going to see Dr. Geronimus. So that is her phone. The state objected to my asking Ms. Farber about that, but it's obviously clear in light of the testimony that that phone was Jennifer Dulos's phone paired to that vehicle at 2.56 p.m. on the afternoon of May 24th, 2019. And the state concedes that Mr. Dulos was in Farmington at at least 1 o'clock or so on that uh, afternoon of the 24th. The idea that, um, I'm not sure I may have misunderstood Mr. McGinnis, so I apologize in advance, that he said that um, that, she, that they don't have to show whether who these unnamed speculative co-conspirators were. I, I don't know if he said that she, they, had to sh they didn't have to show which one of them she conspired with, or he said the opposite, that they don't have to name other people as long as they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she conspired with photos to us. Um, I also submit, Your Honor, because uh, I prepared for that, that the state misread and misstates the holding in State versus Forshaw, which I also cited. In Forshaw, the defendant actually shot someone in the presence of numerous witnesses, then fled, then got rid of the weapon. In that case, the court held, the Connecticut Supreme Court held, that it was obvious that there would be a criminal proceeding that was going to be commenced because she knew there were witnesses and the fact that she fled from it was, um, you know, it was obvious to anybody that there would be a criminal proceeding 
pending. We're talking about here what's basically um, hindsight bias, hindsight creation of what someone should have figured out after the fact based on what was happening at the time. At the time, there's no evidence whatsoever that Michelle Traconis knew what Fotostoulos or anyone he conspired with or uh, aided uh, did to Jennifer Doulos on that day. <clears throat> and there's also no evidence. She did not provide, this is also clear, she did not provide transportation to Mr. Doulos to go to the um, car wash. She was going to an appointment with her lawyer and she picked him up at the car wash and brought him down to Westport with her, and he drove. That's the only evidence that's in this case on that point. Finally, there was no evidence of blood, I want to be clear, in that, in that Tacoma. None. None. There's no evidence she cleaned the Tacoma. She didn't even see Dulos cleaning the Tacoma. All she knows is he handed her a paper towel, said that he had spilled coffee, handed it to her, and put it. And she put it in a garbage bag. Whatever he was doing inside that Tacoma, there is zero evidence that she saw him. In fact, Pavel knew what he was doing. Pavel uh, was told by Dulos that there might have been a hair of, of uh, his wife in there, so he wanted him to take out those seats. So if anyone had knowledge that there may be evidence of a crime in there, it's Pavel Gumieni and not Michelle Traconis. The only difference, I guess, is that Mr. Uh, Urzo, attorney Urzo, representing Mr. Gumieni, had the wherewithal and obtained um, immunity in exchange for cooperation. That's something that Ms. Traconis did not ask for and did not receive. And that's the only reason I submit she's sitting here today. The only reason she's sitting here today. The state talks about, well, we charged her, the court had a question about the tampering at, at Avon, at the car wash. They said, well, we charged her as an accessory to alert the defense, but again, you have to act with the exact same state of mind. So the leap of logic that the state is asking this court to jump to, or for that matter, the jury to come to, she must have thought there was some evidence that would lead to a criminal prosecution or a criminal proceeding because she picked him up. She left at the same time, but that she picked him up at the car wash, and we don't even know what time that was. We just know the approximate time that the coal went in to pick her up, to, for her to come get him. But she wasn't even within range that he could just jump into a car and leave. He had to call her on the phone. And the one last thing that I think there is absolutely no evidence, and it's also, again, improper, Mr. McGinnis just said that the defendant allowed her phone to be used at the car wash. That is simply definitively a false statement. There is no evidence she allowed her phone to be used by Mr. Dulos when a number was written down by the car wash employee. And if your court will recall, just a, two, just a couple of days earlier, Mr. Dulos's phone, his regular phone, had been seized by the police. And it is just as likely, not just as likely, is extremely likely that at that moment he didn't know the phone number, his, the one that he was now using, so he used one that was in Ms. Traconis's possession when they went down, when they were about to go down to Attorney Bowman's office. So based on that, Your Honor, I, I tried to respond to the arguments. I, I'm not going to fight or even contest the fact that there was some kind of untimely death that the jury could find was based on this evidence. I'm just submitting that there is not the evidence that was just submitted by Mr. McGinnis and the idea that one could put assumption upon assumption on speculation upon speculation and reach that conclusion based on this evidence is not even warm gruel. It is absolutely, there is no logical inferences that could be drawn that could lead to the conclusion that Michelle Traconis 
knew anything, anything about what has either happened to uh, uh, Ms. Farber or what Fotis Doulos was doing in, in a criminal act conduct in relation to her disappearance. Thank you. Just quickly, Judge, um, a counsel completely misstates the state's position on these things. What I've said is that a reasonable jury can draw these inferences, um, not that uh, these things are definitively in the record at this point. Obviously, a reasonable jury can infer that the defendant allowed her cell phone to be used as evidence in the totality of all the evidence, so he misstates it. I also never said that all these items were tested positive for blood, I, and I don't think I even used the word luminol in my argument, so I guess we're just making things up now uh, as we argue to the court, but I did just want to follow up on the one issue, Judge, State versus Vasquez, 68 Con App 194 on the accessory liability issue. I just wanted to give the court one case. I didn't have a chance to research all of them. Just on that count five issue. Thank you. The court will just begin by indicating what the court has to find in a motion for judgment of acquittal. Of course, the court does not have to determine that the state has proven each and every element of each and every offense beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the province of the jury. The court has to determine whether there is sufficient evidence on each count to go to the jury. Now, in so doing, the court cannot, in this court's view, allow to filter into its decision what the court thinks of any witness's credibility. The court is not making credibility determinations and determining how it will rule on a motion for judgment of acquittal. What the court is required to do and is able to do is to determine what, if any, reasonable and logical inferences can be drawn from the evidence that has been adduced. So the court is going to address the motion in just broad strokes. This is in no way a marshalling of evidence concerning intent of the defendant. The jury can reasonably consider that the defendant's remark that Jennifer Dulo should be buried next to the dog is evidence of motivation. The jury need not conclude that. The jury can consider it. That statement was made before May 24. The jury can consider certainly that the blood found on the cut garments in the trash on Albany Avenue is evidence of Fotis Dulos' intent to restrain and kill Jennifer Farber Dulos. The jury can reasonably conclude that because the defendant indicated that Dulos was at home on the early morning hours of May 24, but indicated later on that he was not, that she knew where he was going to go on May 24 and was covering for him. The discarding of evidence on Albany Avenue uh, is an indication that the defendant knew the purpose for which those items were being discarded. The jury can conclude that even though the defendant did not drive Fotis Dulos to Russell Speeders, that there probably was an arrangement whereby he told her, pick me up later, 
at Russell Speeders, which means she knew the reason he was going to be there. The jury can conclude these things. Again, the court is not required to assess the strength of the evidence. The court is just required to determine whether or not there is enough evidence to go to the jury. Now concerning the remarks about multiple conspiracies, the court believes the Second Circuit has concluded that a conspiracy terminates when the central purposes of that conspiracy are attained. So, for example, if the central purposes of the murder of Jennifer Dulos had been attained on May 24th, that's the end of that conspiracy. Then there's another conspiracy. So, and that conspiracy is to hinder prosecution or tamper with evidence, for example. So the court is not persuaded that the state cannot charge multiple conspiracies and it is uh, too early to consider at this point any arguments concerning a vacator of any of the convictions, if there are any convictions. So the court finds that there is enough evidence to go to the jury on counts one through six. And the motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. Time is 11.25. We'll resume the session at 11.40. We'll stand in a recess. All rise. This honorable spirit court now stands in recess.
Uh, what the court will take up first is uh, the schedule for the rest of the trial. The court understands that uh, the defense has at least one witness scheduled for today and probably will not conclude until Monday. Is that correct, Attorney Sean? Um, we are endeavoring to complete by Friday, but based on just everyone's schedule and whatnot, it, it, we are we may not conclude till Monday morning, but it's very likely we might be able to conclude by Friday. I'm just indicating there are witnesses for each day. If they're not as long as anticipated, then we might be done by Friday. We're trying to have everyone here by Friday, but we would have to cancel if it was running late. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may just be heard briefly. Uh, Council has informed us the last night a few names of who may be called today. And prior to them coming out, uh, the state wanted to raise an uh, issue with respect to, I think, two of the witnesses uh, outside the jury's presence. So uh, I would ask your honor if you wish to do that now or to hold off. Uh, well, right now, let's just continue with the scheduling. Yes, your honor. The court is going to assume that the defense will conclude sometime on Monday morning. So what the court will ask uh, both uh, sides to do is uh, file with the court proposed jury instructions by the close of business on Friday. The court will anticipate that the defense will present its, its last witness on Monday after the defense's last witness, uh, we will go into the charge conference, which has to be on the record. The court then anticipates after the charge conference, the court will proceed with the contempt hearing. Tuesday morning, closing argument. Attorney Manning. Yes, Your Honor. Um, the state yesterday that uh, they intend to introduce, uh, I'll start with the Farmington police officers, Your Honor, with respect to the evidence concerning the, um, the, moment, the manner of death of Fotos Dulos, and the, essentially the suicide, Your Honor, as well as a suicide note that was found next to him. Uh, the state's position, Your Honor, is that this evidence is completely irrelevant to the case. It has nothing to do with uh, Michelle Draconis or the charges that she is faced with. And the state is um, seeking to be heard on if that evidence is going to be presented in what way. And some off feels that there should be an offer of proof and I'm, I'm requesting an offer of proof with respect to the Farmington police officers that were subpoenaed today. Um, there also, counsel also provided the state with the name of a Cheryl Briere. That name appears nowhere in any police report or in connection with this case in any way, shape, or form. So the state is asking for some kind of offer of proof as to what the relevance is of Ms. Briere. I would indicate if it is character evidence, it would not be for truthfulness because the defendant has not testified as of yet. So the only thing the state could assume, and I, again, I don't like assuming when it comes to this, is that she would be a character with witness for some kind of character trait at issue. I just feel uh, at this point, Your Honor, since Ms. Briere's name is not in any way on any form, report, or in any way connected to the case, uh, the state is uh, requesting either an offer of proof or that she be precluded from testifying. Um, uh, do you wish to respond, Attorney Shore? Yeah, I don't have my witness list uh, in front of me. The, I don't want to call it a witness list, list of names. I just want to confer with that first, if I may. Her name is on the list, Your Honor, so I think that the state's claim is unfounded. 
I just want to be clear. I'm not claiming she's not on the list. She was. She's not relevant to anything in this matter. She does not appear on any police report, any statement given, anything that has to do with this case. So the state has no notice as to the content of her testimony. As such, the state is asking for an offer of proof outside the presence of the jury in order to find out exactly what she will be testifying to. I will just recall what the court said when we objected to witnesses who were irrelevant. The court said they'll take it up as the witness is on the stand if there's a particular question. Um, we filed, I can't even remember how many, 20 motions in limine. The court did not require the state once to do an offer of proof, not once during their case. So the fact that she's now asking for that, for a witness, just because she did not or the state did not go out and investigate people that they've had since October. And I know we weren't required to provide a list, but these, this name was definitely on the list. There were a number of names we put on that list. The state cannot now claim, well, we didn't know when they failed to investigate uh, the names on the list. As the court is well aware, the defense could have simply called people. We don't have to give the court a preview of what each person is going to testify to. They can object if something is asked that is not relevant. I know the rules of evidence. We certainly wouldn't be caught, even if, and I know this is not what we're doing, but even if we were going to put on um, evidence of, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, character, even if that was, we would not be required to have that person write out a letter of recommendation to what they were going to testify to. So this is not only unnecessary, but it's also unheard of as far as I'm concerned, Your Honor. Well, the court will first address the representation by the state that a witness is to be called <clears throat> by the defense to testify about the manner of death of Fotis Dulos. How is that relevant? Well, first of all, this is not this morning's testimony, Your Honor. So again, I didn't get any opportunity to have the defense. The state has had not once had to make an offer of proof towards any of their witnesses. The purpose of presenting the evidence of the fact that he is unavailable as a witness, the state was allowed to uh, state on the record that Mr. Mawinney was unavailable. I'm entitled in our case to show the circumstances under which he is not available in the case. I do not intend these police officers to testify as to cause of death. It's the fact of death. There's going to be a death certificate that I intended to introduce to show he's not available. So it's relevant to the circumstances, certainly more relevant than I would submit half of the state's case was about the lack of evidence that they were able to present. Well, so, it, it is not a stipulation that Otis Dulos is deceased. No, Your Honor, and we're not willing to stipulate to that. Well, well, the court's question is, for what reason are you calling the Farmington police? I'm the state represented that it's to indicate that Fotis Dulos is deceased. So, and then the court understood you just, to just say that you're not willing to stipulate to that. I'm just going to note that at no time did this court require the state That's to give... That's not the question. The question is... You just indicated to the court that you wanted to call the police officer to testify that Otis Dulos is deceased. I No, Your Honor, I didn't say that. I said that's Perhaps the, the court misunderstood. Yes, it's the individual officer who found uh, Mr. Dulos in his vehicle on, on the date in question. That is the purpose, on, and that, for the record, would be January... January 28th, 2020. Um, I've heard the state say, well, the jury may have questions about it. There's been some testimony about the circumstances. This is to complete that circle, if you will. And then I would be introducing a death certificate and a decree of death as a certified copy of the decree of, of uh, probate death. Well, just to close that circle of information. And that is the purpose of that testimony. The court does not understand what the circle is. The court is under no impression that the jury 
would have questions about whether or not Fotis Dulos is deceased. So, well, again, I've made my offer. I didn't think I should have to, but I did. If the court is indicating that we cannot present that portion of our defense, at least it'll be on the record. But I'm indicating that we would intend to put on evidence of where he was found, that he was taken to the hospital. And, and then there's also the fact, which I would then, once we've presented that, there is the suicide note where he exonerates Ms. Traconis. I recognize that it doesn't come in under as a statement in contemplation of death. In other words, not a dying declaration, but I would attempt to present sufficient evidence that it would come in under the residual hearsay exception, that there is no other way to get that statement in. The court may, at that point, in its discretion, determine it doesn't meet that, but I have to put on the evidence in order to reach that point. Again, for the first time in this case, only the defense is being Counsel, required. you need not repeat that. The court right. was not aware of what the defense counsel was attempting to do. If it was simply the fact that Fotis Dulos is deceased, the court would not allow that testimony because it's not relevant. The fact that Fotis Dulos essentially wanted to exculpate the defendant is another matter. If I may be heard on that, Your Honor. Well, that's going to be a matter that comes up at the time. That's fine. Thank you. Again, if the matter was simply Fotis Dulos is deceased, the court would not allow it. Which witness uh, is the defense prepared to call at this time? Robert Haynes, Your Honor. <clears throat> We can bring the jury in, please. Sir, so would you raise your right hand, please? I'll judge the jury. The jury isn't in yet. Yeah. Counsel stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you out or upon counsel of perjury? I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Robert Haynes, R O B E R T H A I N E S. Thank you, sir. And you may be seated. Thank you. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Haynes. Hi. Um, you go by another name. I know your formal <clears throat> name is Robert Haynes, but can you tell the jury what you're often referred to as? Yeah, Hutch. Hutch would be great. All right. Um, and you're here pursuant to a subpoena, correct? Correct. You and I haven't spoken until about a day ago? Nope. And you're familiar with Michelle Traconis? Yes. You haven't spoken to Michelle Trapona since 2019? No. Do you own a property with a lake or pond on it? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about that property and where it is? <clears throat> we have um, a water ski pond in Avon, Avon, Connecticut. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a private membership. We're all very serious water skiers. Um, you, you would join the club, and it's, it's really kind of a community. It's a very small community. We all pretty much are there <clears throat> most days, and we are tournament skiers, so we practice during the week, and a lot of times we'll, some of us will be competing on the weekends and traveling, and um, there's about 30 members, and it's, it's a big family. I'm going to ask you a few questions just about the pond and the area. Um, 
you call it a pond in terms of compared to other water ski areas is it a relatively small pond or a large one <clears throat> it is small no it's very small um, a lot of people will ski in open lakes. This pond is about 1,600 feet long and maybe 300 feet wide. So it's not a pond where you can go off and just really ski and go for long runs. It's a competitive site where you're, you're either in a slalom course or you're on a jump or some people will trick ski. So it's a, it's, it's a three event competitive lake versus like an open water lake. Are, are Very small. Uh, are you familiar with the term short setup? Short setup. Yeah. So the short setup is, um, in most, in most places or most lakes, you can get up behind the boat. This is referring to slalom skiing. You get up behind the boat, you have a minute or two to adjust your shorts or whatever. And then you're in the course, you go through gates, you turn around six buoys, and then you drop at the end of the lake. Our lake is incredibly short in that you get up and you don't have time to do anything. You are immediately in the gates, you go through the six buoys, and then you're in the water again. So you come, <clears throat> you literally come up behind the boat, behind the boat, you ski for 16 seconds, and then you drop down, and then you do it again. So you're not you're not even skiing for a minute. And this property that you own this property? Yes. Is it private property? It is. Um, how long have you had the ski club? Um, we've been skiing there for about 45 years, I would say. Um, I'm 58. I started skiing there when I was about 10. The club itself is probably, I don't know, 25, maybe a little bit more, 25 years old. And is the pond open year round? No. Can you tell the jury a little bit about how the season works, when it starts and <clears throat> when it ends? It's very weather dependent, but the earliest we could possibly open would be the end of March if, um, if weather cooperated. We have some really serious skiers in our club that will put on heavy wetsuits and ski in very, very cold water. So they might get started at the end of March. Typically, typically we wouldn't really start skiing until May. And uh, we would ski always through September and a lot of times to the end of October. And during that period of time when you're open during ski season, is it throughout the week? Is it Monday through Sunday or just on the weekends? It's every day. So it's every single day. There's people there all the time. Um, you know, with 30 members, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people in our club that might find odd times to ski when they know there's not a crowd there. Because if you go on a, on a Wednesday at 5 o'clock when people get out of work, there might be you know, 10 people waiting to ski, and that could be an hour and a half or two hour wait. Is it more crowded on the weekends? It's more crowded on the weekends, but on the weekends, everybody has all day. So they can hang out and not, you know, you're losing daylight on a Wednesday. So we may be only, only be able to ski till eight o'clock at night. So from five to eight, everybody's trying to get their ski set in. On a weekend, there may actually be more people there, but you have all day to ski, so it's there's no nobody's worried about getting their time in. Would people make reservations to be able to ski, or would they just come down and show up? Pretty much, they would just come down and show up. So, yeah. And while people were waiting to be pulled on the skis or to ride the boat, um, would they often hang out? Is there an area for people to hang out? So we have a very large dock. Um, and most of, and we do have like a picnic area with a tent over it, and um, we have a couple areas to hang out. But yeah, everybody, I mean, you're everybody would socialize in one place or another, and you're waiting. You could be waiting two hours to ski, so you're there, you know, you're there just kind of hanging out. You'd get in and out of the boat. You'd take turns driving the boat. Um, you'd take turns 
riding because you always need a driver and you need somebody riding. Um, so you're working ski lines and, you know, all that kind of thing. So everybody, it's busy. Everybody has kind of something to do. But it, at the same time, I mean, <clears throat> these guys, the people that are in the club, most of the people have been members there from the beginning. So it's it's a family. You're hanging out, talking to them, and, you know, a lot of times talking smack. <laughs> and would, would people bring dinner or lunch down sure. there sometimes? Sure, yep. So, and, yep. And when you say people um, had been there mostly from the beginning, was – are are you familiar with Fotis Dulos? Yes. Was he a member of the ski club? Yes. Do you remember when he joined the ski club? I I can't tell you exactly what year, but I'm going to say it was 2005, maybe. He, um, I know he moved to Connecticut with his first wife and joined our club. And I got to say it's, I don't know. I got to say it's 20 years ago. Do you know the name of his first wife? Hillary. Um, had you met Fotis Doulas prior to 2005? Yes. I've known him. He was a water skier, so I've known him, you know, through water skiing um, probably 10 years prior to that. So since 19, about 1995? Probably, yeah. So when... Um, the first time I spent any time with Botus was when I got married. Boy, don't ask me for a date because my wife's out there. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But um, we flew to Greece on our honeymoon, and <clears throat> I had Fotis's name, and we um, met Fotis one day, and he showed us around. Our honeymoon was in Greece, and he showed us around Greece. That was really the first time I ever spent any time with him. And was Fotis a competitive water skier? Yes. Were you also a competitive water skier? Yes. Uh, did you see him at water ski tournaments? Uh, yeah, definitely. In state as well as out of state? Yes. Do you know whether Fotis often traveled um, out of state for competitive water ski tournaments? He did. He was, for in his younger years, he was on the Greek team. So he he water skied for Greece. So those are European tournaments. Um, and then he would ski tournaments all around the country in the U.S. Did you also come to know Fotis's children? Yeah. Do you know whether they water skied? They did. Do you know whether they traveled out of the state for competitive water ski tournaments? They did all the time. And was that with Fotis? Yes. Had you, in fact, seen them out of the state at competitive water ski tournaments? Yes. Had you had the opportunity to observe Fotis at the water ski club with his children? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about um, whether or not they water skied together and for the amount of time that they may have stayed at the club, not as to what was said, but just your observations? And to, to narrow it down to a certain time period, I'll say between 2000 and 15 to 2019. So I'm going to object, Your Honor. Uh, this is a, irrelevant. It's a vague question. It's well, uh, relevant, Counsel. Um, just his observations and awareness of uh, Fotis during that time and what he observed. Not relevant, it's being. Did you know Jennifer Dulos? Yes. Did uh, Jennifer Waterski? No. Did she hang out at the pond ever? Objection. The time frame, vague. Well, Any? Well, the, the question is ever. So overruled. You can answer. Uh, rarely. She would, she would come down. <clears throat> so her kids would be, most of the time, her kids would come to the pond <clears throat> with, um, with a nanny and... Um, they would ski with Fotis and their nanny would be on shore taking care of them. Um, it's not that Jennifer was never there. She was there every once in a while, but she wasn't, she wasn't there most of the time when the kids were there. It was always a nanny. Prior to 2017, did you ever socialize with uh, Fotis and Jennifer? Objection. Uh, well. 
Relevance, 2017, prior to 2017. Relevance, counsel. Your Honor, uh, I'm getting into Mr. Haynes's knowledge of the time period when Ms. Traconis moved into the house and Ms. Dulos moved out of the house. That's going to be my next question. Well, the objection is sustained. Did there come a time in 2017 when, um, do you know where Photos lived in 2017? Jefferson Crossing, right? Yes. Um, is that, is that where yes. Mr. Dulos lived yeah. at the time? Did there come a time when Ms. Dulos no longer lived at Jefferson Crossing? Objection. Well, um, what's the ground, please? Relevance, it calls for speculation. Well, if, if there was a friendship, it would not call for speculation to overrule. You can answer the question. I don't recall him ever. Well, he was a builder, so he lived in a lot of homes. But I don't, in that time frame, I don't remember him moving out of that house. Do you recall whether Jennifer moved out of the yes. house in 2017? Um, did there come a time when you met uh, Michelle Traconis? Um, I met Michelle very briefly at a water ski tournament in Florida. Um, Fotis had his kids down there. I had my kids down there. And um, I was briefly introduced to her. Uh, I, I thought it had to have been 2016, maybe. So prior to 2017, yeah. you recall meeting maybe, Ms. Traconis? Maybe 2017, yeah. Do you know if Michelle Traconis moved up to Connecticut? Um, she, yes, she did. And do you know when that was? There was definitely um, a long gap after the 2000, after I first met her. I feel like it was probably a year or maybe two years after that. I don't, don't hold me to the time frame, but um, I know she moved up a little bit, at, I mean, a ways after my first encounter with her. Did, um, around that time period, did Fotis ever talk about um, an intention that he moved Michelle up here? Yes. He talked about it, about having a girlfriend, and eventually he was going to get her up here, yes. Did Michelle ever join the ski club? Yes. Do you know when she joined the ski club? Um, I think it was... 2017, I think it was 2000, it was either 2017 or 2018, but she was a member. Would you see Michelle at the pond frequently in 2017? Yes. Would you speak with Michelle when she was at the pond? Yes. And you said that at the pond there were sometimes social events? Um, yeah, I mean... Not planned, but there was so many of us around all the time that, you know, regularly, I mean, there were summers where we eat dinner down there every night, and there's always other people around. So whether it's simple as getting a pizza or doing something a little bit more where everybody's bringing something, yeah, we had, you know, social gatherings all the time. It wasn't a planned gathering. Everybody would ski and then just hang out. So between 2017 until early 2019, had Michelle and Fotis attended some of these social gatherings? Sure. And had you socialized with Michelle and Fotis outside of the pond on occasion? Yes. <laughs> you had told the jury that Fotis uh, had skied, water skied with the children at the pond. Did there ever come a time um, when Fotis was unable to ski with the children? at the pond. Objection. Grounds. Cause for relevance, calls for speculation, hearsay. Well, the court is not clear on the relevance. Your Honor, I'm going to link it. It's subject to connection. If I can ask a few follow-up questions, I'm going to establish Mr. Doulos's um, behavior related to the custody and visitation. Well, there's no foundation for questions about custody and visitation with this witness. 
I need to ask some foundational questions, Your Honor, related you to that. You can ask the, the direct question. Did there come a time when you learned that uh, Fotis could not see his children? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Well, overruled. I, I remember a point where, I, and I felt like it was sudden because I wasn't completely knowledgeable on everything that was going on, but I, I remember that Jennifer at one time left the home, and I believe she took her children with her. Do you remember, without getting into what was said, Fotis's, um demeanor or emotion or attitude towards not being able to see his children? Objection. Overruled. Oh, he was, uh, he was upset. He was very upset. I mean, those children were his life. I'm going to fast forward now to 2019, um, prior to the ski season getting into full swing. Um, did Fotis ever express to you an immediate expectation that he would be skiing with the kids at the pond again? Yes. And that he was expecting to be able to take the kids to compete in water skiing again? I don't object, Your Honor. This all calls for hearsay. Expectation of future, immediate future conduct. Which he would say and express, which is a hearsay statement. Well, at this point, the question is, or is the question, did Fotis Dulos talk to this witness about his expectations? Is that the question? Yes, Your Honor. And if I may, Your Honor, when, what time, and again, it's a hearsay statement about what he is expressing, his statement at a specific time. I can rephrase that, Your Honor. In early 2019, did Fotis express an intention to be competing with his children again? Object, is that January? Is that February? Object on time, it's vague well, the question. the question is in 2019. So the court is going to overrule the objection. You can answer that. He was expecting to get his kids back into skiing and be, being able to spend more time at the pond and skiing with them again. He did not mention competitions. Do you recall when in 2019 that was? Um, that was that Thursday night. And when you say that Thursday night, was that May 23rd, 2019? Yes. Uh, can you tell the jury about his demeanor or attitude towards um, that expectation? Um, I, th I mean, it was, when Fotis and I talk, 90% of our conversation is water skiing. We just, that's, we never did business together, really. We never had any outside life other than water skiing. Um, he was definitely devastated when he didn't have his kids skiing. So I think he was excited that he was making progress and he felt like he was making progress. And he definitely said he thought he would have them at the pond a lot more prior years he didn't have them down there at all. And <clears throat> I think I think he thought he was going to be able to get shared custody and be able to spend weekends with them skiing and even, you know, sometimes during the week. And I that think that's a, what he was hoping for. Okay. And that was around May 23rd, 2019. I want to talk about May 23rd, 2019 because, um, well, can you tell the jury if you, you saw Fotis Dulos on May 23rd, 2019? I did. Can you tell the jury a little bit about uh, those circumstances? Dinner. We were uh, invited to his house uh, for, I wouldn't call it a dinner party, just a, there was six of us, um, just a, you know, a gathering, nothing formal, just, and it wasn't last minute. We probably talked about it a couple of days earlier, and um we met him. We went over to their house for dinner. Who were the six people who were in attendance at, is this Fort Jefferson? 
Yes. Who were in attendance at Fort Jefferson on May 23rd, 2019. My wife and I, um, a local realtor, Stefan and his wife, Beth, and Michelle and Fotis. <clears throat> and your wife's name is? Erin. Do you remember what time you got there that night? I honestly, I don't. I'm guess. I think it was somewhere around six thirty. My guess. Do you remember what you ate for dinner? Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was chicken. It was a Greek salad, maybe French fries. It definitely had a bottle of wine. Uh, do you remember Fotis stepping out at any point in time in the evening? I do not. When you saw um, Fotis that night on May 23rd, 2019, do you recall whether his hair was short or long? Or... I think it was short. And had you ever seen him before in previous years with a very short haircut? Sure. And did um, people at the ski club often have short haircuts? Yeah, we have a couple members in our ski club who would shave their head, not shave their head, but definitely cut it way back for the summer. Just Were you surprised at all about his haircut? Um, not really. It was, I mean, going from long to short is always a different look, but I wasn't surprised. I didn't think anything of it. And... Was anything unusual about that dinner? No. Even looking back in hindsight, was there anything unusual about that dinner? No. You talked a little bit about Fotis's mood. Did he seem happy? Um, yeah, it was just, I mean, I, happy. He wasn't, I mean, he wasn't, he was, very friendly, you know, we hung out. It was very relaxed. There was nothing odd about it whatsoever. Even now, looking back, all those... Even now, looking back. In hindsight. Yes. Um, do you know what time, do you recall what time you left that evening? I'm guessing it was somewhere close to 10 o'clock. Do you know whether you left before or after uh, you said Stefan and Beth? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I left before um, they did. And the reason I think that is because I remember walking out and seeing a nice car in the driveway and saying, real estate must be good. <laughs> is, is Stefan in real estate? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall leaving of your own accord or was anybody wrapping up the dinner? No, I think, no. After you left, so that's May 23rd, 2019. Um, did Erin leave her purse at the, uh, at the house? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the circumstances surrounding how you find, found that out and, and what happened next? Um, we drove home, and I think when we got home, Erin realized that she had forgotten her purse, and um, instead of, she wasn't overly worried about it, instead of, it wasn't like at a restaurant, it was in somebody's house, and um, I don't remember whether she, I, I feel like she may have texted Michelle that night and said, I forgot the purse, it might have been the next morning, she may have, may have been the next morning. I don't remember. And did, how did the purse get, was the purse eventually returned to your wife? Um, they had texted between themselves and arranged to have Michelle drop it off in my office, um, which she came by and handed me the purse. Um, do you know, when you say she came by the office, is that at the pond? Yeah, it's in front of the pond. I owned a business there, a self-storage facility with an office up front. So it was my place of work. So I was working and she just walked in and hand, handed the purse. All right, do you know if she handed the purse directly to you? Or she to, did. Okay. 
Do you recall talking to her at all when she came to... It was very brief. Um, I, I feel like she was going to the grocery store, mentioned on my way to the grocery store, but it was a 10-second conversation, not even. Was there, any, was there anything unusual about her demeanor at the time? No. Even looking back in hindsight? No. Um, so that weekend, that, that was Memorial Day weekend, at, at some point... Uh, you learned that Jennifer was missing. Mm -hmm. And at any point in time that weekend, did Michelle or Fotis come to the ski club? Um, we did not see them sat Saturday, but um, I saw Michelle at the pond pretty much all day on that Sunday. I believe Fotis was going to see his kids or try to see his kids Sunday. So he was not there. Um, Michelle spent the day at the pond with her daughter. And then Fotis, um, I think later, it was probably late afternoon, early evening, showed up at the pond. And can you tell the jury a little bit about what Michelle's demeanor was like on that Sunday at the pond? So I believe <clears throat> there was state police at, at her house. I don't know whether they were in the house or parked out in front, but I know um, she didn't want to be there. Um, so she was obviously agitated. Um, I remember she tried to ski. I mean, the water was still very cold, but she was, um, she was upset and she was definitely teary-eyed. And you said Fotis came later in the evening? Yep, Fotis, um, I don't think he was able to see his kids, so I think uh, he ended up back at our place, or back at the pond. Um, I would say sometime, it was later, maybe 5, 30, 6 o'clock. Did Fotis, when he came, seem upset or concerned? Um, he was upset that he didn't see his kids, for sure. Um, yeah, he was upset. But that was your impression that that's what he was upset about? I feel about? like he was upset that he didn't, yeah, he wasn't able to see his kids. During um, that weekend and the days that followed, was there a lot of media presence at the pond? Um, yes. It was unbelievable. Was there a heavy police presence at the pond? Um, there was heavy everything at the pond. So we had... Um, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, it was nonstop. So you have podcasters calling. You have reporters driving in, calling. Um, the state police, you know, showing up at my office to look at surveillance. Um, our, the pond, our pond is it's sacred ground to us. We have 30 people in our club that love that place. And the state police come in with dogs, and they search the place with dogs, and then they put a boat in the water, and they go over the whole pond with a boat looking for a body. It was awful. And it, it obviously still is upsetting for it, you. Yeah, no, it was, it was probably one of the most painful, painful times of my life. Um. And they searched your property pretty thoroughly. Yep, I gave <clears throat> the state police came down early in the week, and I gave um, I gave a tour and showed somebody and told them all about the the pond. And then I feel like it was a couple of days later they got a search warrant and they came down with dogs and taped off the whole place. And there had to have been twenty police officers just doing their searching the whole place. And then. I don't know if it was a couple weeks later or it was when it was, but they came and did it again, this time with a boat, to put a boat in the water. And you cooperated fully with that? Absolutely. Um, did, you, did you speak to um, Otis around that time? <clears throat> the only real contact, I mean, around, around so... Yeah, I mean, we during that week, no, I didn't see him at all. In May of 2019, do you remember um, 
Fotis ever saying something to you about Jennifer having left in the past and he expected that Objection. she would show up? Effect on the hero listener, Your Honor. Well, it, then it's court, irrelevant. Court, well, this is not going to be a street corner argument. The court knows of no exception to the hearsay rule effect on the hearer. In this court's view, that's folklore. That's not the law. Then existing emotional or mental condition is an exception to the hearsay rule. This is not being offered, as the court understands it, for the truth of the matter asserted. Overruled. You can answer that question. So Fotis would look at me and over and over the few times I saw him, he would say, I did not do this. I did not do this. And um, he did at one time tell me that Jennifer had run away at some point earlier in her life. And I don't know the details of it. And he said, she's doing it again. I have one more, please, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross examination, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good. Uh, my name is Michelle Manning. I represent the state. I'm going to ask you a couple questions, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Um, now, briefly, you talked a lot about on direct about you on the pond. Yes. Okay. And uh, that's what the ski club. What is the ski club called? Old Farm Skiers. Okay. And it's members only? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Fotis Doulos was part of that water ski membership. Yes. Correct? Okay. And Michelle Traconis was as well. Yes. And now you also own the storage facility that's around that pond? Yes. Okay. Did. And, and um, with respect to uh, water skiing is important to you, correct? Yes. Yeah. You've been doing it a very, very long time, yes. correct? Okay. So, I mean, you own a pond. You, I think you described everybody as a community, yes. would you say? Okay. And uh, Michelle Traconis was part of that community, wasn't she? Yes. And in fact, you talk about many times that you would just hang out on the dock, maybe have dinner together, things like that. Is that correct? Yes. And you would talk to her a lot during the time she was there, correct? Um, you'd socialize. We'd so. socialize, but in a group. In a group? Um, yeah. yeah. In, like, in English? Yes. Okay. And uh, I want to ask you some specific questions about the party on May 23rd. Um, you were, it was planned a couple days in advance. That was your testimony, correct? I think so, yes. Okay. And you've had, uh, uh, you didn't know that Stefan Reich and Beth Johnson were going to be there that day in advance, did you? I feel like I did. You feel like you did? Yeah, I think there was going to be six of us, yes. Okay. Uh, did you, was Stefan Reich part of the Water Sea Club? No. Okay, and Beth Johnson wasn't either? No. That was, honestly, that was the first time we met them. That was the first meeting that night? Okay. And you were invited by Fotos Dulos? Yes. Okay. And I... Uh, you got there, I think you testified around 6.30? I'm guessing, I don't know. I just don't remember exactly well, what time. It's been about five years, you would say? <laughs> Is that fair to yep. say? Yes. Okay, and when this first happened, there was a lot of media attention. Yes. I think you talked a little bit about it. You mentioned this was a very difficult, I think your words were, this was the hardest thing that you've ever gone through in mm -hmm. your life? Yes. Was the media attention? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, by the way, you see the camera behind me? Yes. And it's been, have you, have you been watching on TV? No, haven't seen a single second of it. Okay, but have you noticed the news reports? No, I won't watch it. You won't watch it at all, mm -hmm. right? Because you're very close to Fotis. Yep. Okay, well, it's a very, very big part of your life for, I think you said, 30 years. Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, at the dinner party that night, um, the um, kind of impromptu dinner party, you'd say, right? It wasn't very formal. No. no. Okay. It was you, your wife? Yes. Okay. And um, Stefan Reich, correct? Yes. Uh, Beth, I think she was Johnson at the time. Yeah. And uh, Michelle Traconis and Fotos Dulos, correct? Right. Okay. 
And I think you testified that there was nothing odd about it. Those were your words, correct? That's correct. Okay, but Fotis talked about the fact that he really wanted, couldn't wait to get that. He had an expectation he was going to get the kids again, right? Is that correct? He, yes. And he talked about, I think you testified, you talked about the fact that, you know, on May 23rd, he uh, was excited. He was going to take the kids water skiing again. I think those were, that's what you said too, right? I, I, yes, he was, he said he was making progress where never before has he been making progress to get them to never. get custody or to get visitation. Never before? That's, you remember him saying that? R repeat that. Um, you said he's been making progress where never before he's Well, been... he, up to that point, I don't think he really had the kids at all. Okay. And not even, I mean, he would, he would be able to see them once in a while, but it wasn't. It wasn't very consistent. And on May 23rd, he, he mentioned that he thought he would be able to get more visitation and that we might be seeing the kids at the pond where we haven't in a long time. Did you discuss the plans to murder Jennifer the next morning at the dinner party? Did say that again? Did you discuss the plans with, did Fotis Dulos discuss in Michelle Draconis discuss the plans to murder Jennifer at the dinner party on the 23rd? No. Did they discuss with you at the dinner party to dispose of evidence of the murder in the garbage yeah. cans of Albany Objection. Avenue? No. Wow. Argumentative. Well, the question is essentially the leading question that does it was the intent to murder Jennifer Dulos discussed at the dinner party. And your objection is argumentative. Well, the clear answer from this witness is going to be no. So the objections overruled. Did you have those discussions, sir? No. And uh, what about the plan to use the Tacoma and clean it afterwards? Did he discuss to, that? To what? To use the Toyota Tacoma and then clean it afterwards. Did he discuss that with you? No. And uh, let's. Because you talked a lot about the um, media influence on the pond and how uh, the police coming with, uh, I think, it, did you say it, uh, they searched the pond one day mm -hmm. and then they came back with a boat mm -hmm. and divers? Did they do that? Okay. And um, that was the, wor again, the worst experience of your life, them searching for- It was an awful experience. It was an awful experience. Yes, <clears throat> awful experience searching. The whole thing's an awful experience. Yes. Of course. Uh, you watching the pond being searched for a uh, dead body of a mother of five was awful for you. Um, we Objection. That. Sustained. And nothing further, Your Honor. I have a few follow-up questions. Um, the state had asked you about speaking to uh, Michelle Tricornis, and she spoke English, correct? That's correct. Did she sometimes struggle to find the right word? Sometimes. Um, and she would, she would ask what certain things meant? Yes. And the state had asked you about um, FOTUS's communications about making progress. Uh, were you aware at the time that a uh, custody report had come out? Objection. Sustained. Uh, did FOTUS talk um, specifically about court proceedings in terms of making progress? Objection. Well, did he talk about it? The answer is either yes or no. The witness does not remember, so that's over here. Do you want me to re-ask that? Yeah. Um, when you had mentioned that Fotostoulos was talking about making progress, was that in the context of the custody proceedings in court? Yes. And the state asked you some questions if you were part of some plan to do something nefarious, and you had said no. No. Um, you've known Fotis for decades. Yes. Right? Um, and even in hindsight, looking back, uh, there was nothing to alert you to the fact at the time, right? No. no. Nothing at all? No. No further questions? Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Haynes, you may step down. Is there another defense witness available at this time? 
Yes, we won't get done with that witness, but we can certainly start unless the court wishes. I figure we should start. Yeah. And I've had Attorney Felsen is, I think, bringing him in at this point. I do. Can you please state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, Stefan Reich, S T E P H E N R E I C H. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Reich. Good afternoon. Would you please uh, indicate to the members of the jury what you do for a living? I'm a real estate agent with uh, Coldwell Banker in Avon, Connecticut. Where do you live? Avon, Connecticut. With whom? Uh, my fiance, Beth, Beth Reich. <clears throat> How long have you been a real estate agent? Since 2009. Can you tell the, uh, the jury a little bit about what kind of real estate, uh, there's different kinds of real estate agents, right? Yeah, you have commercial, residential. Yeah. So I, I worked primarily uh, residential, uh, new construction, um, land acquisition for building, um, luxury properties, and that's most of what it was. What area, uh, is it mostly in Connecticut? Yes, mostly the Farmington Valley of Connecticut. So Avon, Farmington, Simsbury, West Hartford, you know. Can you tell me whether or not uh, you knew Fotis Dumas? I did, yes. Did you know Michelle Traconis? I did, yes. How did you get to know Fotis Dumas? Uh, actually met Jennifer uh, while she was walking the first set of twins, uh, Petros and Theodore. Um, at the development, they lived in Canton and Griswold Farms. I lived there as well. I met Jennifer while walking the dog a few times and seeing her around the neighborhood. And for the record, when you say Jennifer, who are we talking about? What's the full name? Jennifer Dulos, Jennifer Farber Dulos. And at the time you met Jennifer Dulos, was she married to Otis Dulos? Yes, she was. Did you become, uh, could you just tell us whether or not you had a friendly or unfriendly relationship with the Duloses back then when you met Jennifer? No, very, very friendly. Can you just describe briefly, uh, uh, you said you, you met Jennifer when she was walking her twins in a stroller? In a stroller, correct. Could you just describe in a little bit, did you have a conversation to see her? What did you do? I saw her. We just, you know, started a conversation. You know, they were new to the neighborhood. I was new to the neighborhood. I moved from New York. We just, you know, kind of hit it off, just having general conversation. I had seen her subsequently a few times while she was, you know, she would walk the babies in the strollers quite often. And she had suggested that we come over to their house uh, with my ex-wife at the time to just have a drink and get to know each other. And did you do that? Yes, we did. Approximately what year was that, if you recall? Oof. Um, I would say probably 2008. How far away did you live from the Dulouses back then? Less than a half a mile. Was just, it the same neighborhood or was, just on the same road? The same subdivision, same neighborhood. They were... We were on one street, they were on the next next street over, down the road. Did you also uh, develop a um, social relationship with Fotis Dulos, other than just going there once for drink? Yes. How would you describe the, um, the relationship as it developed over the next few years? The relationship between whom? Between the, well, let's, maybe I should separate them. Between you and Jennifer Dulos and you and Fotis Dulos during that time. Uh, we had gone out to dinner several times. I mean, we just, you know, would mostly go out to dinner and socialize. Um, and, you know, we'd always talk. And I was transitioning work-wise from a family business. And Fotis had suggested that, you know, I possibly get my real estate license and do sales and marketing uh, for his company. Did you go into real estate and get your license because of Fotis Doulis' suggestion? I did, yes. 
Could you tell us what was the uh, employment of Mr. Dulos at that time when he made that suggestion? What did Fotis do for a living? Is yes. that the question? Yeah. Uh, he owned a company called Four Group, which was, you know, a higher end uh, luxury home builder in the Farmington Valley. And when you got your real estate license, did you have any uh, professional dealings with the Four Group? Once I got the license, I obtained all of the listings that the Four Group had. And would that indicate that you were you made you had income from and through the Four Group? Correct. During that time frame, did you continue to maintain a social relationship with both Jennifer Dulos and Fotis Dulos? Yes. Do you water ski? Uh, I have. I am not a water skier. Uh, I snow ski, but uh, I have water skied with them, uh, I think maybe three times. Uh, but that's just not, not really my thing. So when you say with them, did Jennifer Dulos during that time frame water ski? I water skied at the pond, I believe, two times with Fotis at the pond in Avon. And then I did water ski with Fotis and Jennifer in Greece when we were there for Clay and Noel's baptism. So uh, do you know what year that what baptism would have been of Noel? She was the youngest daughter, correct? She was the youngest one, yes. Do you remember I, approximately I, what I, year that I was? I don't remember the exact year. What were the circumstances of you being in Greece at the same time as the Dulos's back then? They invited us to go there for the, for the baby's christening and to have a vacation. Where were you water skiing with, with the two of them? Um, I don't know. It was an area where Fotis had skied kind of growing up, and we skied with some friends of his, and Jennifer was on the boat, and, and she skied as well. Do you recall whether or not Fotis Dulos was involved in any competitive water skiing activities during that time where he'd actually compete? He was, yes. Did you ever observe or go to a, I don't know if it's called a tournament or a meet? I don't believe I've been to a competition. I mean, I have seen him ski at the pond, you know, a couple of times, but I, I don't know if that was a competition per se. Did you ever observe any medals or ribbons or any other certificates he got as in his competitions? Yes, I've, I've seen that. Where did you see them? Probably Facebook post or, you know, after an event, he would tell us how he did. Were you, you have how many children? I have one child, one biological child. Was your child of similar age to any of the Dulos children? Uh, my child was the same age as the second set of twins. And for the record, how old is your child now? Fifteen. Did your child go to school with any of the Dulos children? Yes. Where was that? Uh, the Farmington Valley Academy, Montessori, and Ava. Did there uh, come a point when the Duloses moved from your neighborhood to another neighborhood? Yes. Do you recall when that was? Um, I, I don't remember the exact date, no. Were you, uh, at the time, working for a real estate company, or were you on your own? No, working for a real estate company. I started with William Ravis from when I got my license, I think 2009 to 2017, and then I've been with Coldwell Banker since. Did there come a separate time when you went to work for the board group as an employee? That is correct. I still maintained my real estate license, but I... Uh, it's, I was not a 1099 with four group at, at one point. I was uh, a salaried employee. When you say 1099, if you're a real estate agent, do you, how do you earn money if you're selling property uh, through a, that's being built by a, a building? You're earning commissions, and then you're getting a 1099 from the broker at the end of the year. Tell the jury about your employment at four group where you actually were a, uh, you were salaried? Correct. Could you just tell the jury how that came about? Fotis did not like the fact that I was earning a lot of money in commission on the sale of some of the properties. So he wanted to bring everybody in house and then kind of share in you know, some of the commission proceeds. So uh, I kind of still did the same thing, but my role was maybe expanded to do more you know, sales and marketing for the company. and working with architects um, you know, down in the Fairfield County area to try to uh, have four group included uh, in bids for custom homes. You said he didn't like that you were earning so much money. Uh, during this time period, 
Uh, what was the usual commission that you would earn for the sale of a home? It, it depends. It, it's, it's a percentage of the sale of the home, but it was it was more not outside of four group, but you know the homes that four group sold. Some of them were millions of dollars, and you know the commission numbers added up. And you know, four group didn't participate in in, in that money. That money came to me. I believe I earned it. I worked hard to sell those properties. But it, but if the if the real estate commission was based on the price that the house sold, is that correct? Correct. You would earn more money if the house was more expensive. Correct. Yes. Did the four group tend to build expensive homes? Yes. How long or what years did you work as an employee for the four group? I believe two thousand fourteen. Sometime in the year till probably January 2017. During the time you worked there, what was your actual responsibility and job? Sales and marketing of the existing homes that we had, maybe speculative homes, uh, marketing of homes that were, quote, to be built. Well, these were paper listings that we would um, sell a land build package to a potential client. Um, I'd help out with renovations that the four group was doing, uh, land acquisition, um, working with the municipalities to subdivide land. So working with the town, working with planning and zoning, you know, what, whatever, whatever was needed. Was there a difference between a custom built home and a speculative home, as you just put it? Yes, a custom home is some a home we're building for a specific customer that you know they've given deposits and it's their home versus a speculative home where the company, Four Group, is putting up the money in hopes of, of selling it as quickly as possible, preferably during the time of construction so that the carry costs would be minimal to the company. During the time that uh, speculative homes were being built, what was your role while you were an employee? Well, there was speculative homes, custom homes. Like The role never changed regardless of you know what homes were being built. I see. Did you meet with prospective buyers yourself during that time? I did, yes. Not by myself, but mostly with, with FOTUS together, FOTUS and I. Do you know when you stopped working for the Ford Group? I believe it was January, end of December, January 2017. Well, let me, end of December of 2017 or the end of? No, it was either the December 2016, January 2017. Could you indicate to the jury what were the circumstances for you leaving the board group? Uh, he terminated me. Can you tell them why? Um, he wanted all the employees to sign a non-compete agreement. And the non-compete agreement was like, it was just beyond the pale of what it should be. It was incredibly restrictive. Um, maybe maybe the jurors know what it is, but maybe you can just explain what a non-compete agreement is or was in your case. It basically said, I'm an at-will employee, so Fortis can terminate me at any point. And if I would have signed the non-compete, um, the way it was written, it basically prevented me from being a realtor. It prevented me from... Um, using any subcontractor the four group used, it prevented me from using any architect that four group used, and it prevented me from contacting any client. And a lot of those clients were my clients that I brought to the four group. So it was just, I heard it was not enforceable because of the language, but at a principle, I just was not prepared to sign it. And how did you find out you were being terminated? Uh, Fotis wanted everybody to sign it. He said, if you don't sign it by Monday, don't show up for work. And I didn't show up for work. Did it change your relationship with Mr. Dulos for you to be terminated under those circumstances? It, it certainly did. It certainly changed you know, the, the business component of it because I lost a lot of the listings, not all of them. I think I had like one or two of the multiple ones that were out there. Um, so, yeah, it, it had an impact. During the time just before uh, you left or were told not to come in in the December of 2016 or early January of 2017, uh, were you still in touch with Jennifer uh, Dulos? Um, 
I don't know if I was in touch with her. Most of the social interaction was when we were like visiting with both of them together, like going out or if they had an event at the house that we would go to. So I didn't see her on her own outside of FOTUS. Um, yeah, maybe saw her at the grocery store or whatever and you know, give her a hug and a kiss and say hi or, or see her at the school. Um, but it was mostly the relationship was with both of them. Did you continue to socialize with the Duloses while you were an employee? While I was an employee? Yes. yes. Into, including going out to dinner and showing up to at events and yeah, parties? Yeah, we went, I mean, we went on vacations together. We went to dinner together. They had events at their house. Uh, we had an awards thing for home builders that we would go to every year. How would you describe, while you're an employee, the, the relationship that you observed between Jennifer and Fotis Duo? It was positive. I mean, we'd go out to dinner. They would sit very closely together. They would always share an entree. Um, but it seemed like it was a good relationship. Did you become aware at one point that uh, Jennifer uh, had moved out? I, I did. <clears throat> and how did you find out about that? Um, I think I think Fotis told me. I, I don't remember exactly, but... When she moved to New Canaan, I, I found out about it. Did you uh, have any reason to believe that that was going to occur before she moved out? But can you repeat that? Yes. Did you have any inkling that Jennifer Dulos had planned to move out before you found out she actually moved out? No. <clears throat> Did you have any contact with um, Jennifer Dulos after she moved to New Canaan? Uh, I did after Hillier died. I, I reached out to her to express my condolences because he was a... Uh, after who died? After her father, Hillier, passed away. And what was the nature? Just describe the... I don't need the substance, but what was... How was that in terms of the... Was it cordial? Was oh, yeah, it, it was very cordial. I just said, you know, I'm so sorry for the loss of your father. He was a great man. He, he helped, you know, the company very much. I've met him many times and I thought he was an amazing person, and I was sorry. And how long was that conversation? Um, I don't remember. After you stopped working for the company, did, it, did you still have a business relationship? I still had a business relationship. He gave most of the listings to a couple other agents in the area. Um, and then over time, um, the listing started coming, coming back to me. Same kind of um, home, same kind of construction. Yes, correct. Same just under end. under a different dynamic. That it was just you know I'm representing him as a realtor. There was no other relationship, uh, and that was it. Back to getting a 1099 in a commission. Correct. Yep. Your Honor, um, I'm going to move on to another subject. Perhaps this might be a good place to break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume the session at 2 o'clock. Uh, please do not discuss it.
Should I have the witness? Yes, please. please. Thank you. Bring the jury in, please. <coughs> Council stipulate? Please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright, I think that when we uh, left off, you had uh, gone back into work as a realtor, uh, but you were still working on projects of the uh, from the Ford Group. Is that right? That's correct. Were there any specific properties that you were the exclusive agent for after you left Ford Group? Uh, in, I, let's let's limit it to Farmington in case there are more. I believe it was just. Um, I can't remember if I lost eighty Mountain Spring temporarily. I remember I kept five eighty five Deercliff, and then I did resume eighty Mountain Spring. So let's just talk briefly about five eighty five Deercliff. Um, in relate, I'm not going to show you a map. We, the jury has seen the maps of the area several times. So where in relation to, for, to Jefferson Crossing was 585 Deercliff? Uh, if you exit Jefferson Crossing, you would make a right, and that would be Deercliff. If you make a left on Jefferson, that's Eli. So you would make a right. It's probably a quarter of a mile down the street on the left on the view side. Where approximately was the town line between Farmington and Avon? in relation to Jefferson Crossing? If you make a right out of Jefferson Crossing, it was very shortly uh, after that, within 100 feet, I believe. And 585 was in Avon? Correct. And 80 Mountain Spring was in? Farmington. Farmington. <clears throat> when you were the, how long was it that you remained the, uh, the uh, real estate agent for marketing of 585 gear? Until it was sold. Do you know when it was sold? Um, I don't know the exact date, but within the last two years. So since 2019? Yes, correct. <clears throat> Can you describe what condition that property was in prior to it being sold? Uh, significant disarray. Do you know why? Um, Fotis's mother died at that location, and... Previously, he had used it for, like, when he had friends from Greece come over. His mom lived there at some point. Uh, I believe after that event happened, he just kind of let the place go. In all honesty, it was a teardown anyway. Like, that house more than likely would be purchased, and then it would be demolished, and a new home would be constructed on that piece of property. Was it a choice piece of real estate? Stunning, beautiful. Could you just describe for the jury? Because um, I don't think they've seen that aspect of it. It's uh, a 4.49 acre parcel uh, in Avon, 550 feet of road frontage on Deercliff, which is you know a, one of the nicer streets in in the area, uh, and it had just you know sweeping views of the Farmington Valley. So views, location, acreage, road frontage, kind of had it all. Was it on the? Uh, was it facing the the west? It was facing facing west. So you're on top of the mountain, looking west, looking down on the Farmington Valley. And so the you, property itself was there a significant drop off that permitted these views? Yes. Could just describe that rather for the jury. Well, you had the house, and then you had a backyard, and then it, it dropped off significantly. A cliff? Uh, I wouldn't say a cliff, but yeah, pretty pretty steep. Was it at the top of Avon Mountain? It was, yes. You said that um, you had 80 Mountain Spring as a, um, uh, you were under contract or you were the realtor for that property as well? Correct. You said you lost it for a period of time? When, after I was terminated, I believe he gave it to somebody else and then I, I believe I did reacquire the listing um, yeah. and then subsequently sold it. 
Were you the listing agent in 2019 for 80 Mountain Spring? Yes. Were you familiar with the work that was being done to convert 80 Mountain Spring into a property to be sold? Absolutely, yes. Could you indicate to the jury a little bit about the property? They've seen photographs, they've seen aerial and drone footage, but could you describe what this house was and how it was converted? Um, well, I did sell the property to the four group from the original owners of the, well, I don't know if they were the original owners, but uh, I represented four group to purchase the property. Um, you know, the house was very dated, needed a lot of updating. Some of the rooms were very choppy. Um, on the third floor, there were like five or six bedrooms, a living room, kind of very small. I mean, the house is, it's a hundred year old house. Uh, so we, we purchased the home, four group purchased the home, hired uh, a well-known architect from Fairfield County and did just a complete remodel of the house. I mean, top to bottom, everything was redone. Was the house demolished or was it uh, reconstructed and expanded? Could you explain? Reconstructed and expanded. The original house had a two-car garage that was actually below grade, so you would park underneath the house and have to go upstairs to get to the main level. Uh, what Four Group did was they added a four-car garage on the east side of the house and had a very large bonus room above that, so they added a four-car They got rid of the basement garages, added a four-car garage plus the bonus room above that four-car garage as an addition to the original home. How much acreage did that property have? Um, I would, I don't know exactly, but I, around 7.5 to 8 acres in total. Do you know whether or not that house uh, in May of 2019 was completed, that is, was construction completed? It was, yes. Was it being marketed at that time? It was, yes. Where Had there been showings of that house? Yes, there was. Incidentally, um, if there was a showing for the purchase of the house, were you present, usually? <clears throat> if the listing came through the MLS, if there was another agent that wanted <clears throat> their client to see the house, I would be notified because I would have to approve of the showing, per se. And FOTUS did insist that the listing agent be present at all showings. It, it, it makes it a lot easier to talk about the highlights of the house. And there was so much work that was done. He felt, and I felt as well, it would be vital to have me there to kind of explain the work that was done, all the attributes of the house, and answer any questions. So uh, on showings that were originated, per se, through the MLS, I would be present. Were there times when a real estate agent might show that property to someone that you were not present for? Uh, the only circumstance that would be is if FOTUS was showing that house as a, a representative sample of what a custom home could be. So if there was a client that was interested in building a custom home, they could uh, sometimes photos would show him that house to say, you know, clearly for this case, not the outside, but on the inside, this is, this is, you know, the quality of our work. With, in other words, they would not be seeking to sell that house, that property through a different agent. They would show it as a representative of his work. Is that what I understand? Correct. And they've done that with Ford Jefferson and they've done that, you know, could be any of the properties. In fact, was Fort Jefferson Crossing for sale technically at the time that um, Fotis was living there in May of 2019? Um, I'm not 100% sure. If there was a for sale sign out front, would um, that suggest that it's yes. shown in videos? Yeah. It had been on and off the market, yeah. When you worked for the Ford Group, how often would you uh, would Fotis be in the office when you were there? Most times, unless he was traveling, he was he was usually there. Did he work long hours that you observed? Sometimes. 
when you came in, what time did you usually come in when you were? 8.30, 9 o'clock. And when you came in, did you often see him there already at work? Yes. And after you left in the evening, what time did you usually leave? 4.30 to 6 o'clock, depending on what we were doing. And when, again, when you were working there, was Fotis still often working after you left to go home? Sometimes, yes. You said he traveled. Just Would you just tell us a little bit about how often he traveled while you were working there? Uh, towards the end when I was working there, travel definitely increased. Uh, Miami, um, go skiing, uh, competing. I know he went like internationally to competitions, um, but it, it seemed at the end he traveled more. Um, while you were still working there, did you ever uh, have conversations with him about whether his children would be competing? Uh, he did mention, yeah, I, I believe some of the children did compete. I think Petros and Theodore did. Water skiing? Yes. Was that nationally or internationally, if you know? Um, I don't know. I, I think maybe both, but I'm not 100% sure. Did you know the Doulos, Doulos children? Yes. Was the office part of the house, or was it? did it have kind of a separate space and entrance? It was a part of the house. I mean, they designed that house to have a home office. There was kind of an employee subcontractor entrance on the right side of the portico share, which is the breezeway, which goes from the front to the back of the house to that parking area. So we would always enter the house through that door on the right side, up the stairs and into the office. But then you could get to the main house from I think the east side of the office went to um, one kind of sitting area on the second floor. Uh, you go down the hallway to the bedrooms, or there was a staircase down which went to the mud room and towards the kitchen. When you were working there, did the employees tend to wander into the residential portion of the house? No. It was basically separate? Well, I mean, you could physically walk there. We just, you know, we, we, we didn't. I want to ask you um, specifically now about um, whether or not you continue to socialize with Fotis after you became the realtor and were no longer working for him. I did, yes. What kind of socialization or social activities did you engage in with him at that point? That is go, after out, you went. go out to dinner or go to the house once in a while? And at the time, who were, did you have a partner? Yes, Beth. Hey, could you just indicate, um, Beth, what's her whole name? What Beth did... Johnson Reich. <clears throat> Are you now married to her? No. Would you socialize together with Beth and with um, Fotis? Sometimes with both of us, sometimes independently. Do you recall a time sometime uh, in 2017 when Michelle Traconis had moved into the house? Yes. Did you ever see her uh, when you were at the office for real estate related matters? I believe so. Did you talk with her? I'm sure I did. Yeah. Did you socialize with her and Fotis? I did. Did you socialize with her separately? That is you and Beth with Michelle without Fotis? No. How would you describe your relationship with Michelle Traconis after she had um, become part of the household? I mean, I, I think I've only met her six, seven, eight times, but it was it was always positive, friendly. I mean, was there a time in um, in um, 2019 where Mr. Dulos would talk to you about the status of his custody battle or custody dispute with Jennifer? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Well. Uh... Well, it calls for yes or no answer, or perhaps the witness does not remember, but at this point, it does not call for years. So, overruled. He did, yes. Could you just describe uh, the what, in general, he would say about the process to you? And it's not being offered for the truth. It's the fact that it was said. Well, Objection. The court understands the... phrase, it's not being offered for the truth, but but if the court cannot see other than being offered for the truth, the court is going to sustain the objection. 
What did he say about the custody battle? If it's not offered for the truth, what is it offered for? It, it's being offered to show how Mr. Doulas was projecting his optimism towards the situation, and that's the purpose, not to the actual truth. So well, then the question is, first question that was asked, did he discuss with you the custody matters that concerned him? The answer was yes. The next question, based on what counsel said, need not deal with content. It's his response to whatever custody issues were occurring at the time. For example, this is just the court's <coughs> view to avoid a hearsay objection. Was he aggravated? Was he happy? Was he enthusiastic? Was he expectant? All right. Let me let me ask a question that would encompass what the judge's concerns are. Okay. Did you, uh, you know, uh, the preliminary question is, did you have such uh, conversations with him about it? Yes. And that would be in around April and May of 2019? E even before, but... But in that time frame, could you, using as opposed to his words, could you describe his um, his demeanor, attitude, his outlook about it? Can you put a, a, a time frame yeah. on that? Because I've April seen different May. emotions, you know. Yes, you April know. into May of 2019, that time frame. Uh, positive emotion. Did there come a time, uh, well, did you become aware at least that there had been a report that had been issued without going into what it is that there had been a report on the custody matter that he had seen objection Your Honor. did there come a time when you were invited to dinner in may of 2019 yes could you tell the jury a little bit about how that came about um we were actually supposed to have dinner with them on the Tuesday prior to Thursday. Um, so that we're clear, are we talking about the week that, or did you become aware at some point that uh, Jennifer Doulis had been reported missing? Yes. Would this have been in that week just prior to that? The, when we had dinner? When, the, when you had the discussions about dinner. That would have been the week before we actually had that dinner on that Thursday night. Okay. Yeah. So how did it come about? You were supposed, you were just beginning to say you were supposed to have it on a different We week. were supposed to have dinner on Tuesday, and then I mixed up the custody schedule with the kids. So that week we have alternating schedule with the kids. So one week we'll have them Monday, Tuesday. One week we won't have Monday, Tuesday. So we had the kids Monday, Tuesday. We were supposed to have dinner on Tuesday. I let them know that I mixed it up. I can't do it. We don't have the kids Wednesday, Thursday, but Beth coaches her kids' soccer team. So would Thursday work? So he said, yeah, come over. Thursday, 5 o'clock, we'll come to his house. We were going to look at some rugs from Michelle. And then the plan was to go to a Japanese restaurant in Avon. Now, there's, there was, just to clarify, when you talk about visitation and custody, we're talking about your children, not Mr. Dewey. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. So um, the plan was set to uh, get together at what time? Five o'clock. And were there email exchanges with regard to that? There was text message exchanges, yeah. Can you tell me whether or not, well, who did you go with, first of all? With Beth. Do you know approximately what time you arrived? Uh, I don't know exactly, but if we were supposed to be there at five, I probably would have got there at five or a couple minutes before. When you first arrived, uh, did you, where did you first see Fogus Dulos when you were arriving? I was heading north on Eli towards Jefferson Crossing. And prior to us entering Jefferson Crossing and making a right into Jefferson Crossing, <coughs> Fotis was leaving. So I, I passed him on, on Eli Road prior to entering Jefferson Crossing. Prior to passing him, did you stop and have some conversation near the intersection? Yes. Could you just tell the jury what that was about? Objection. 
Well, what the conversation was about is just what was the topic. The court will allow that overrule. He just said, oh, I'm just, I'll, I'll be right back. Go head on over and I'll see you in a little bit. Did you say anything to him about him leaving at that moment? But yeah, I mean, he was like notoriously late. We used to call it FOTUS time, you know? So I was like, oh, classic FOTUS, you know, I'm coming and he's leaving. Um, and he was like, he said, he'll be back shortly and, you know, head on in. When you said that you, if the time was five, you would have been there at that time or earlier. Do, do you have a habit with regard to punctuality? Yeah, I'd like to be punctual. And was there any reason that you would have been delayed or not be punctual that day? It's possible, but not likely. So when he left, did you continue on to the house? Yes. And did you go to Fort Jefferson? Yes, we did. You pulled into the driveway? Mm -hmm. Did you pull into the back? Into the back, yes. So just tell us what you did when you went in. Uh, went in, and I think we greeted Michelle. And um, I don't remember exactly play by play, but we did. But she was selling these like really cool rugs from South America, um, a kind of cowhide rug. So we went early to purposely just go and look at the rugs to potentially purchase. And then the plan was to go to dinner. And we being who exactly? Beth, sorry, Beth and I. You said the plan was to go out to dinner originally. Is that right? That's correct. Did you end up going out to dinner? No, we did not. Would you tell the jury what actually happened in terms of did, did you eat? Let's start with that. Did you get to eat? Yes, we ate dinner right. there. Would yes. you explain the circumstances, how that came about? How what came about? How you, how you ended up eating. Where did you eat? Oh, we ate outside on the patio. On what did you have? We had steak, french fries, and uh, a, a, a salad. Now, Mr. Uh, Doulas told you in the, in the intersection on Eli Road that he'd be right back. Did he come right back? I believe he came back shortly thereafter, yes. Did he stay or did he go out again? No, he did go out again. What was the circumstances where he went out again? He said he needed to get more meat to, you know, facilitate cooking for everybody. Did he then, you see him leave? I, I maybe saw him left the house. I didn't see him depart, but yeah. Did he come back at some point? Yes. Do you know how long approximately he was out? I, I don't know. Half an hour, something like that. I don't know. Incidentally, are you familiar with um, the uh, the what we, what's called the little stop and shop in West Hartford? Yes, I am. In relation to where Fort Jefferson Crossing is, can you tell us whether that would be the closest grocery store? Um, trying to think of the closest. Uh, Before you, let me ask a different question first. There's now a Whole Foods in Avon, is that right? That's correct. Was it finished and operating in 2019? No, it was not. Okay, so if that didn't exist, would the little stop and shop in West Hartford be the closest? It, distance wise, it might, it might in fact be. Okay. You don't know which store he went to? I do not know. Do you recall whether he came back with uh, some meat to grow? Well, he said he was going to get meat. I, I mean, we all ate meat, so I assumed he came back with me. So when he came back, what did you do? We were outside, probably cooking on the grill, having a drink, talking. How would you describe the atmosphere during that dinner? Positive. When you say positive, what do you mean? It was just, it was a normal dinner party. I mean, we were talking, laughing, you know, talking about real estate joking around. I mean, it was just like, it was a normal evening. Did Mr. Dulos at all talk? Well, what did he talk about? Objection, hearsay. And well, Your Honor, it's well, not being offered for the truth. It's Well, if, if the question is what topics came up, we're right. going to allow that. What topics? We talked about real estate. We talked about politics. I mean, just a bunch of different topics. I don't remember exactly what was said and like throughout the evening, but it was just a normal evening. Did he talk about his children? Yeah, yeah. He loves his children. He misses his children. What was his uh, air or his uh, attitude about things with his children? Uh, he was of the belief that 
things were getting better as far as the potential custody of his children. And was he, did he seem happy or sad? No, he seemed, he, that night he seemed, he seemed happy. Were people at this, and did anyone else come to dinner that night? Yes. Who else came? Um, Hutch, Hutch Haynes and, and his wife, Erin. And again, was the, the atmosphere similar when they were there? Yes. Were people laughing? Yes. Were they eating? Yes. Was Fotis known to be a co good cook? Yes. Did he do the cooking? He did the cooking. Did he make a salad? He made, he made the salad dressing. I don't know if he made the salad, but. Okay. You said French fries. Was there anything particular about Fotis Doulos' French fries? I'm going to object at this point, Just Your Honor. Do you have a special machine to make French fries? Objection. Just How long uh, were you there that evening at the house? Probably till around 10, 10, 15. And after the, uh, were you the, the last uh, couple to leave or did the Haynes leave first? No, the, ha the Haynes left first and then we helped clear all the stuff from the table. I think uh, Beth and Michelle did the dishes and I think we left shortly after that. And we, did you continue to talk with Fotis while we while you were uh, cleaning up? I would imagine so. Yeah. Did either he or Michelle disappear for a period of time during this dinner party? No. Was the atmosphere the same even at the end, after dinner, after you were cleaning up? Yes. Was there anything at all at the time that you could think of that suggested that uh, things were not going well that evening? In, in respect to what? Like that he, just, in his attitude or anything, did he ever act in any kind of surreptitious way or disappear, or get on his phone or anything like that? No. I mean, he might have got on his phone. That's certainly possible, but there was nothing that jumped about at me, even with the benefit of hindsight, that something was wrong. You actually were interviewed by the police at some later point, correct? I was, yes. Were you, you were asked whether even in hindsight, whether there was anything that seemed off that night, correct? Correct. And as you sit here even today, was there anything that you'd think of that raised any kind of red flag with you that something was go off or odd? That evening, no. I'm going to ask you um, if you know the name of Rania Minutis. Uh, I do know the name, yes. Uh, who is she? She's a real estate agent in the Farmington Valley. Just have a moment. Yeah. I for, forgot to ask you, but while you were, when you first arrived at the, at the house with Beth, did you see any of Fotis' employees on the property at that time? On the property? No. Did you see any before, uh, before dinner? Yes, as I was... As I said earlier, while we were pulling in, before we made a right into Jefferson Crossing, Fotis was leaving, and uh, one of the employees was behind him. Do you know who Pavel Gumieni is? I do, yes. Did you see him at all that evening? Uh, I don't remember. And I, like When I was interviewed, I, I didn't remember who was behind him. In I, I, It was either Pavel or Andy, and I couldn't definitively say it was Pavel or it was Andy. I just... I. It's not something I commit to memory. I just saw them leaving and pulled in. Were they in separate, when you say behind them, in the same vehicle? Or no, separate? different vehicle. I have no further questions. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, I just want to start by uh, actually asking you a couple questions about Jennifer. 
Okay. okay. You talked on direct about um, meeting her first. I think you lived at the same complex. Is that correct? That's correct. And Griswold Farms in Canton. In Canton? Yeah. Okay. Um, you actually uh, said on your testimony, you remember her walking um, Petros and Theodore, right? In the stroller? In the stroller, yeah. Okay. And did you actually become friends with her first before FOTUS? I, I did meet her before FOTUS, yes. And I probably saw her three times while she was, she would come up my street on the cul-de-sac and I saw her once getting the mail and I saw her a couple of times while I was walking the dog and we chatted the first time, you know, new to the area, just, she was very friendly, said, hi, I'm Jennifer. These are my two boys. Um, you know, we lived on the street and. And that know, started your. That kind of started it. Yeah. Okay. And you also talked about going to a Greece for even the, the fifth child, the, the youngest, Cleo Correct. Noel, for her christening. Yeah. Okay. So you've uh, been a part of uh, the kids for a while uh, when they were young. I, I knew all the kids, yes. Okay. Uh, would you ever think Jennifer Doulos would have left her children? No way. Uh, you also talk about uh, Hillary, or Hillard, actually. I Hillard. Say. Hillard. Yes. Uh, and you were grateful for to Hillard, I think you said in your testimony, right? Could yeah, he was. I think he was very instrumental in the success of Ford Group. And, and Hillard is Jennifer's father. Jennifer's father. Okay. Correct. Can you just explain why you think he was successful in in the success of Ford Group? Because he he helped finance a lot of a lot of the company. So, um, if there was, you know, in real estate, timing's everything, right? Mm -hmm. So, there was a builder that had bad times. They had a bunch of lots and. We could buy them from the bank or at a distressed price, but you needed the capital. Like Hilliard gave us, gave the company, not us, gave FOTUS and Four Group the money to buy really whatever was needed. And, you know, we would run it by him. He would, you know, look at the numbers, make sure it was a good investment. But if he felt it was warranted, he, he helped Four Group out with that on multiple, so on multiple occasions. Um, and this was over the years, correct? Over the years, correct. Okay. So if ever there was something that Ford Group was lacking cash in or wanted a big property, Jennifer's father would, would help out? Yes. Okay. And when he passed, you reached out to Jennifer? I did, yes. Okay. Now, um, I have a couple other questions just about Ford Group. When you were working, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you were working for Ford Group. Then you uh, wouldn't sign the non-compete, so you were fired, but you still had a relationship with FOTUS. Uh, he gave the listings to other agents, with the exception of, I believe, mm -hmm. one, which was 585. It was either 585 or 80. I'm pretty sure it was 585. Um, so, you know, he kept me on and gave me something while he started, you know, giving out listings to other agents at the time. So, because you wouldn't sign the non-compete? I think it was, yes. Okay. And eventually you came back to work for Four Group, is that right? I never came back to work with them. I just, he would then give me more listings. He'd give me okay. some of the listings back. Now at some point, and you would get, um, and I'm probably not saying this correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong here, you get commissions from selling the houses? Um, correct. And at some point, did he, FOTUS request or mandate out of Four Group that you would reduce your commission to, I guess, share the love kind of? Correct. The and that would also be after the point when Michelle Tricona started working and assisting at Four Group, doing, I think, marketing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm, do you mean yes? Yes. You, you have sorry. to say yes. Sorry, sorry. it's recorded. I thank, thank you. So she would uh, work at Four Group doing um, what, taking pictures, marketing the property as well? I believe so, yes. Okay. And uh, so she would get paid by Four Group as part of the employee. I, I have no idea how she was paid. I, I was not there at the time, um, okay. so I, I don't know how she was compensated. But it was definitely, she was doing some marketing as well. Correct. Okay. for Ford Group. And you also indicated that she was uh, selling rugs, so she had her own business selling rugs? I don't know if she had her own business, but I, I know she had some rugs, and we had seen one, and she we the whole plan was to come over and, and look at them. Okay. And that was on May 23rd? of 2019. Yes, correct. All right. So you get to, let's talk about the dinner party. Um, you get to Fort Jefferson. 
Mm -hmm. And your plan was to see the rugs first? Were you going to purchase See the rugs first. Them? And I believe we did see the rugs first. Okay. And then you were going to stay for, for dinner? For dinner, correct. Okay. Do you, I know you talked about this on direct, but are you part of the water ski community pond? I am, I am not. I've been there. I have skied there, but I am not a water skier by any means. I'm a snow skier and a golfer, but not. It's not, not for a, you? I, I just said, uh, No. Okay. And uh, so you go there, you, you, uh, did you purchase a rug from the shelter bonus? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. And you stayed for, for dinner. And I think you discussed the fact that Fotis at the time, I just want to make sure I, I say it correctly. You said he was happy, laughing. It was a, a jovial uh, environment. It was. Yes. Okay. And uh, he was, uh, would you say optimistic? I believe so. On the on the May twenty third, okay. And and when you're I didn't hear his answer out loud. I said I believe so. Yes. And uh, you know, at that dinner party, uh, with it was you and Beth, correct. And uh, Hutch and his wife Erin, correct. Okay. Did you know Hutch Haynes and Erin Haynes? I had met. I had never met Erin, uh, but I had met Hutch a couple times. Okay. So this uh, party of the six of you, it wasn't a regular occurrence. It was not. Was no. It? Okay. And did you? At what time did you know that Hutch and Erin were coming as well? I think either when Fotis was leaving Jefferson to go wherever, or after he came back and then said he needed to get more meat for everybody. I okay. think he forgot that we were coming. I don't. I don't know what happened, but uh, okay. I, I had no idea that Hutch and his wife would be there. I don't know if they knew that we were going to be there, but we just rolled with it and so had a you, good night. You learned that night while you were already there, or in route? Is yes, right? correct. Okay, all right. And <clears throat> that night, I mean, you were socializing, talking with everybody, including Michelle Traconis. Yes. Okay. In English. In English, yes. Okay, and. Uh, any part of the discussion that night talk about plans to murder Jennifer the next day? No. Any part of that discussion talk about plans to dispose evidence in garbage cans along Albany Avenue? No. Any part of that discussion involve plans about using the Toyota Tacoma and cleaning it afterwards? No. Okay, that's not something you discuss at a dinner party? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to object that last was argumentative. Well, it's gratuitous. Gratuitous. But that's not essentially a, a ground on which to object, but the jury knows the difference between a genuine question and questions that are gratuitous. So the court is not going to sustain the objection. The jury knows what it hears. If I may, Your Honor, I will move on. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions about 80 Mountain Road, uh, Mountain Spring Road. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you're coming out of Jefferson Crossing and where you met Fotis Tulips coming, you were going up towards Jefferson Crossing? So you're driving up north? I, I was on Eli heading north. North. Yep. Okay. And to make a right into Jefferson Crossing. Into the yep. Road. Okay. Where would, if you're going up and you're taking a right into Jefferson Crossing, where would Mountain Spring Road be? Oh, that would be well behind me. Behind you. Yeah, so behind me, and then that intersects Old Mountain Road, and then, no, is that, uh, yeah, Old Mountain Road, and then you'd make a right, and then make a left onto Mountain Spring Road. Okay, was it a photo who was driving in? He was going in the direction of Mountain Spring Road from Jefferson Crossing. Okay. But
but very close to the entrance of Jefferson Crossing, but he made a left out of Jefferson Crossing mm -hmm. towards that direction. Okay, so you kind of passed like ships passing in a night, is yes, that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, Oh, uh, Fortis Dulles didn't tell you he was going to 80 Mountain Spring Road, no, did he? No, I had no idea where he was going. No. And if I can just have one moment. I have nothing further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Redirect. Yes. Um, you indicated that you didn't know if, uh, well, you didn't know the Haynes were coming. Correct. Was um, Fotis somebody who, when he made social plans, was kind of like last minute? Um, say sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, You're kind of spontaneous? Can be, yes. Was this a formal or informal dinner that night? I think it was just an informal. It was a, what it was supposed to be or what it, and I mean, it was. That, yeah, what was it supposed to be? It was supposed to be go look at the rugs and then go get some sushi in Avon. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. So it was go look at the rugs and stay at Fort Jefferson and have dinner there. And who changed the plan? I think Fotis did. I think Fotis forgot we were coming, and the Haynes, you know, I changed the date originally, so he might have had plans on that Thursday. I, I didn't ask. He just said, oh, the Haynes, the, the Haynes, and so we were like, we're going to stay here. We're like, okay. You never did go out for sushi that night? No. You were asked a question by... Um, Ms. Manning, about your opinion on whether Jennifer would ever uh, leave her kids or disappear and leave her kids. Remember mm -hmm. that question? I do. Um, did you have an opinion on whether, before she had kids, Jennifer would ever do something like that? Before she had kids, if she would yeah, do something that like she that? ever disappear. Objection. Well, what's happening now is this. <laughs> this witness is now being asked about character evidence of someone who's not a witness. Sustained. I have no further questions. Just briefly, Your Honor, if I may. Uh, sir, counsel asked you about Fotis always being um, late. I think he used the term spontaneous or always late, and um, uh, it was kind of impromptu with regards to that dinner party. Mike, do you remember him asking you that just mm -hmm. now? Uh, and so Fotis had a habit of being late all the time. Is that correct? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Okay. I think you called it photos time before. Yeah. All right. Would it surprise you if he was uh, told to be somewhere at 4.30 and he would show up at 3.30? If he was told to be somewhere at 4.30 and showed up an hour early? Yes. Would that, that would, surprise you? Yes, it would. Nothing further. Thank you. Nothing else. Correct. You may step down. Thank you. Defense have another witness for this afternoon. Um, I have another witness about to uh, arrive. I just asked. She's not here. Or yes, she is. She's oh. in the hallway. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Saw the daughter of Pompey's dear country. Could you please 
please state the name and spell it for the record. Sure. Um, Beth Reich, B E T H R E I C H. Right, and maybe she. Good afternoon, Ms. Wright. Good afternoon. Um, are you subpoenaed to be here today? Yes. Um, the name that you just gave us, was that the same name you were using in 2019? No, my name at that time was my maiden name, Johnson, and I still use that name professionally. Could you tell us what you do professionally? Uh, yes, I'm an executive at a medical device company. Do you have any other side employment as well? Uh not side employment. I have side interests. Um, I'm certified as a research coordinator and a domestic violence counselor. Can you just tell us what your educational background is? Sure. Um, I studied opera at the Yale School of Music. I attended Quinnipiac University. I began my master's there as um, I had an accelerated program during my sophomore year. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's, um, a dual major bachelor's in communication and uh, marketing. What town do you live in right now? Avon, Connecticut. With whom? Stefan Reich and our collective children. You have children and he has children? Yes. So how many children do you have separately? I have two teenage boys. And collectively, how many children are there? Three. Did you know um, Fotis Doulos in 2000? Well, did you know Fotis Doulos when he was alive? Yes. Could you tell us how you met him? I met um, both Jennifer and Fotis Doulos um, in November of 2014 when um, I went to the offices at Ford Jefferson Crossing, the Ford Group. Who was living there at that time? Uh, Jennifer, Fotis, and the five children. Did you communicate at the time with Jennifer Doulos? Yes. Um, did uh, Stefan as well? Yes. Did you communicate with Fotis at that time? Yes. Well, how would you describe your interaction with Jennifer Doulos during that time? I'm going to object, Your Honor. How would you describe your interaction with Jennifer Doulos at that time? Okay. Ground. Relevance, we're talking about 2014 interaction with Jennifer Doulos, the alleged victim in this case, Your Honor. Uh, it's not relevant. <clears throat> well, unless the inquiry is going to go beyond 2014, it's not relevant. I understand. This is a preliminary when they met, and I'm going to then progress. So I the court will overrule the objection. Um. Do you want me to describe the moment I met her, or do you want me to describe no, the I'm totality looking for of my the experience? general demeanor of the interaction? Um, friendly, welcoming. She was very happy that uh, Stefan and I were in a relationship, which was brand new in November of 2014. And um, the relationship expanded, and our interactions evolved from there. After that, until, did you become aware at some time that Jennifer had moved out? Yes. So before she moved out, was there any change in the way you interacted with her in terms of demeanor, how, what the relationship with, with you was? Um, the relationship became less of a, a slight acquaintance to a much more friendly relationship. We did socialize um, at dinners, she, uh, I found her to be extremely supportive uh, during some difficult circumstances and stuff in my collective life. Um, I found her to be very intelligent. Um, one of the first times we had a more intimate conversation when we were alone at the home, uh, she used the term effusive. And as a lover of lexicon, I kind of appreciated that a great deal. So um, the uh, interactions were always warm and friendly and welcoming. And did that, uh, when was the last time that you spoke with Jennifer? Uh, I would say perhaps late uh, maybe early, very early 2017, I don't recall exactly, but 
It was certainly not after she left the marital home. So before she left? Correct. Did your children interact and play together as well with her children? Uh, not on a regular basis. Um, my children all ski. Stefan was a competitive skier. I'm a skier. And all the children skied. The Dulos children skied. And as did Foda. So we would find each other together on the mountain. And we would ski together when my boys were very young. So let, let, let's be, I want to be clear. We're talking about skiing on a mountain. We're not talking about waters. Correct. All right. So Winter in skiing. addition to water I can't skiing, get there was competitive uh, uh, downhill alpine skiing? Correct. And the Dulos children were involved in that? Correct. And uh, Stefan's son was involved in that? Uh, I don't recall exactly, but we would usually go as a family when the kids were little. Did you ever meet Michelle Tricones? I did. Uh, what were the circumstances of your meeting her? Um, Fotis and Jennifer had left the house. Fotis and Jennifer had begun their, I don't know if it was legal separation at the time, but their separation. And to be blunt, we kind of got Fotis in the divorce, if you want to put it that way. Um, because he was local and he and Stefan still had business dealings. Mm -hmm. And we, the, I think our first interaction was we had a sushi dinner together where we were introduced. And I think we were asked to be there for that dinner because Fotis wanted maybe a safe space to introduce Michelle. How would you describe your meeting with Michelle? How did that go? <clears throat> uh, fine. Very engaging, worldly woman. Um, you know, just getting to know somebody. It was friendly. Did um, you, do you speak Spanish? Uh, poorly. I did when I was in Barcelona. How long were you in Barcelona? Uh, 12 days. 12 days? Yes. Okay. Approximately. So not for, you didn't live there for a year. No, no, no. I, we travel a lot and I try and learn the language for the country that we're going to. Did you communicate with Michelle in English or in Spanish? English. Did you uh, have any difficulty communicating with her in English? No. Did, were there words that she didn't know sometimes? Nothing that sticks out. Okay. So in any event, um, you socialized with Stefan and Fotis with Michelle? Correct. Over what period of time? Over how long a period of time? Um, from our primary meeting in 2017 until uh, May of 2019. When you said that you inherited, or whatever word you used, <laughs> Fotis in the divorce. Did you ever talk about his divorce in your presence? Uh, he spoke about judicial matters and some frustrating elements about those judicial matters. Mm -hmm. But I think he learned very early on that neither Stefan nor I would welcome any negative commentary about Jennifer. Um, so it was really mostly about his experience during the judicial process and his frustrations with it. I just want to follow up on that. Had you expressed some disapproval of hearing negative things from him about Jennifer? Uh, we never said it outright, but I think our, if anything was perhaps started or proffered, um, it was obvious that we weren't interested in engaging any type of communication like that. Do you recall that there was a specific invite to uh, dinner with Fotis and Michelle in May, and specifically on May 23rd, 2018? I do. What do you recall about the circumstances of that invite occurring, that is before the dinner itself? Like how did the invitation get sent out and accepted, if you recall? I think it was probably just a text request by Fotis to Stefan and then um, we attended. Do you, do you know, what, or can you tell us whether or not um, Stefan had a habit 
with regard to being on time for things. Stefan is militantly punctual, so yes. Is that more, the way you said it, is more so than yourself? Uh, he's very, very punctual on all matters. And um, if the invitation was for a specific time, would, uh, did, did you and uh, Stefan arrive on or before that time? We would have arrived either at the specific time or a couple moments before. Could you tell us, by the way, um, do you recall arriving at, or do you recall driving to Fort Jefferson Crossing for that uh, evening, social evening? Uh, I did not drive. Uh, Stefan was driving the car, but yes. Do you recall seeing someone that is photos outside the house before you got there? Uh, yes. As we were pulling into the entrance to Jefferson Crossing, it's um, gated to a degree. Um, he was pulling out, and we didn't collide, but we um, were parallel, and we rolled the window down and said, hey, where are you going? Um, and it almost seemed like maybe he had forgotten we were going to be there. Um, and then he said something about an errand and left. And then we proceeded to Fort Jefferson. Was there anyone else uh, either with him or following him out of the uh, intersection here? I do recall that there was a vehicle that was following him, but I don't remember exactly who it was or what vehicle it was. I, I'm not 100% certain. During the time that you were uh, involved with um, Stefan earlier on in this relationship, would you spend any time at the Fort Jefferson Crossing offices meeting any of the other employees? Uh, yes. Do you recall whether the person that was following was, it, was an employee? It could have been. I, if don't I don't know, know who the person is, I, I don't exactly remember who it okay. was. I'm sorry. Let me move on from that. Um, when Fotis said that he'd be right back, did he come right back? I don't exactly remember the length of time, but he was back in due course, a very short period of time. Can you tell us when, when you, did you continue on and go into the, uh, into Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, after we exchanged um, communication with FOTUS. We um, pulled the, Stefan's car through the Port Cachere, parked on the French trellis portion of the driveway, and then proceeded into the house. And just for those of us who don't know French, the Port Cachere is the archway that separates the two garages on the left from the two garages on the right? It's the archway, yes, the Port Cachere. Okay. So um, when you arrived, did you go right into the house? Um, I think we went to the door of the mudroom that was adjacent to the kitchen and announced our arrival somehow, and prob I probably brought something. I don't usually go empty-handed, so it was probably a bottle of wine or something, and, you know, put that on the counter, and um, I think Michelle greeted us in the kitchen. Do you recall remember. hearing her before seeing her? Yes, the window was cracked. The window to the right of the door was cracked a little bit, and I heard her kind of speaking to herself. In what language? Spanish, I believe. And when you came into the house, did she, how did she react when she saw you? Well, she knew we were coming because we were there specifically to see something of hers. Um, so, and what was that? Uh, we were going to see some rugs, um, and she had been carrying them and laying them out. Uh, there were some in the TV room adjacent to the kitchen, so it was kind of like pathway from the kitchen to the TV room area. And then there were also some in the offices upstairs, and I imagine they were probably heavy, so she was probably a little flustered, and that might have been what I heard through the window. Is the reason you were looking at these rugs at that time? Uh, yes, I actually have three of those types of rugs in my house, but they're cream and uh, silver, and uh, Michelle didn't have that in her inventory at the time, I don't believe, um, but it was an aesthetic we were interested in. And were these being laid out for what, so you could look at them? Yes. You said some were laid out in the 
you said, and where were they laid out downstairs? In the room adjacent to the kitchen. It had a um, very large sectional, um, a television. Um, and I don't recall any other details about the room. Did it all, did you say you also went up to the office? We did. And uh, were there other rugs to look at up there? Correct. Were they already spread out for you to look at? Yes. Would you describe um, her demeanor while you were there? Um, yeah, she was telling us about the rugs. It was normal. Um, she was happy we were there to see what she was, this, you know, um, selling for her new business and the support. She explained the details uh, where, I think, where they were sourced from and maybe where she was selling them currently, but I don't recall specifically. Did you um, eat there that night? We did. Before, do you remember what you had? Uh, it's a re a meal often repeated, so um, it was grilled meats and uh, fresh French fries because they had a French fry maker in the grill outside and a Greek salad. You say grilled meat. Was that a Greek thing? That for you said it was a common meal. Yeah, it was a common meal with uh, photo at his home. Okay. Um, how would you describe the the tenor of that evening and the meal? Positive. Um, jovial, relaxed. Did another couple come? Yes. Do you remember who that was? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Hutch Haynes and his wife. I believe it's Mary Ellen. I haven't seen her since that day. If her name was maybe Erin, might that ring, yes. ring a bell? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, that's yes thank you. Okay. And when they arrived, did anything change or was it the same atmosphere? No, it was the same atmosphere, just maybe a bit bigger. Do you recall whether at any point um, Fotis left the house? You said he came back in due, due course, was what you said before, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Did he, did he leave again to uh, run an errand? Yes. Tell us about that, please. Uh, he had prepared or taken some meat out for the dinner, and realized that there wasn't enough, perhaps, for everybody, and uh, went to buy some more. Did he say where he was going? Not that I recall. Do you know how long he was gone for? The second time? I don't know, but it probably wasn't that long. What were the subject, did, did people talk during dinner? Yes. What did they talk about? Um, general topics. Uh, Hutch has a ski pond he's very passionate about. So we talked about that, obviously. I had never met them before, so it was an opportunity to learn more about them. Um, we talked travel and politics and current events and interests, you know, the general kind of banter at a dinner. Did um, that bottle of wine you mentioned get, get open? Uh, yes, and I believe there are a couple more. All right. Were there any toasts that evening? Yes. Could you just describe that? Um, we learned that evening that, or I, I should speak for myself, I heard that evening that Fotis had been at Jennifer's home in New Canaan with the children and that experience and their interpersonal um, reactions to each other uh, was very amicable, which we were very glad to hear. And he had also stated that the custodial evaluation- Objection, had... Your Honor. Well, any testimony about what Otis Dulo said about the custodial report or the investigation is not admissible. And follow up, counsel. So uh, without getting into what the custodial report said, 
what was the um, the mood regarding the toast? What was the toast about? I'm going to object, Your Honor. This is clearly asked for hearsay. Well, the preliminary question is, was the toast about what was in the custodial investigation or the custodial report? That's the, and then the court can act on the objection. If that's the question you wish to ask counsel, you may. Yes. What was the, the toast? I don't know any words that were particularly said, but the general sentiment that I recall was a feeling of excitement that there was going to be positive resolution for them both um, during what I knew to be a very difficult custody battle, which despite if you're which side you're on, it's very, very difficult for either parent and very difficult for the children. And the sentiment was that maybe this was going to end and there would be more peace. And how did you react? What was your reaction? Uh, Were you happy? Objection, you... Your Honor. Relevance. Relevance, counsel. Well, the fact that she heard something and, and reacted to it <laughs> is the purpose of these uh, questions. Well, this the jury can draw no probative value from this witness's reaction to what Fotis Dulo said, sustained. Was there um, any negative comments whatsoever said about Jennifer during this day? No. Was the uh, entire evening a positive and hopeful evening? Yes. Was that true even after you finished the dinner? Yes. Was that true after you finished uh, the toast? Yes. At any time, did you see Mr. Uh, Dulos uh, act in any surreptitious or uh, underhanded manner during that dinner? No. Anything that stood out as being odd? Just that when we drove in, he was driving out, and he almost seemed like he had forgotten we were coming. Okay, but you said that that wasn't odd for him. I don't know if I actually said that, but um, it's often that in my experience with men, um, if you're a host of something, you might forget sometimes. Okay. And how was uh, Michelle's attitude that evening, her demeanor during that dinner? Um, engaging, friendly, um, positive. At any time, did you see her act in any strange way or leave the room in any surreptitious way? Not that I recall. Did she join in in the toast? I don't know how many hands were in the center, but I imagine she did. Was everyone, were people laughing? I would, I, I don't exactly recall. Were people smiling? Yes. Do you recall whether uh, you were the last to leave or whether the Haynes left before you? Uh, the Haynes left before us. So if you arrived at, uh, what time did you arrive? Five o'clock. And uh, what time did you stay until? Uh, I think it was around 10, 10.30. And you said the Haynes left before you. Do you remember how much soon? I don't recall. Did you, after dinner, did you help with anything? Uh, yes, we, uh, Michelle and I cleared the table and uh, worked on the dishes, and I'm not quite sure what Stefan and Fotis were doing. All right, but did you chat with Michelle while you were doing the dishes? Yes. And what was the tenor of that conversation? Nothing negative. Nothing that would bring me pause. And was it upbeat? Yes. Do you recall... Um, I'll withdraw it. Never mind. Um, even now, almost five years later, is there anything in hindsight that you think was strange or odd during the dinner, during the time that Fotis was present in the house or Michelle was in the house that, in, with 2020 hindsight, would make you think differently about that dinner? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. You've described what it was like how you felt, how it seemed that it was going. Now, five years later, with this case going on and all that 
has been in the media since then. Is there anything in hindsight that you think was odd or about that dinner that you didn't uh, bring up at all? About that dinner, no. Yes, or no. that evening? No. I have no further questions. Well, do you wish to uh, take the afternoon recess now and cross uh, afterwards? That's probably a good point, Your Honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take our afternoon recess. Please do not discuss the case.
Uh, excuse me, Your Honor. I'm going to. Re I thought Attorney uh, Nelson went to get the witness, but let me find out what's going on. Judge, this is actually about another witness, so I don't know if. This regards another witness? Yes, I don't know. To be heard or already testified? Uh, neither, actually. I just wanted to put something on there. I don't know if the witness may be step seated. out for just. Oh, all right. I don't know that's fine. That quickly. But then the jury is. Oh, that's right. All right. Can we approach it sidebar then, Judge? Thank you. There is a question about um, part of the defense has been that Fotis Doulis was telling everyone he knew, including Michelle, how good things were going now that the custody study came out and how optimistic he was. I thought the court's ruling was we couldn't get into the actual custody study. Whether what Doulos said was true or not, it happens to be because the court is aware, true, but whether it was or not is not the issue, it's the fact he said it, so it's not being offered for the truth, it's being offered to show the reaction that he's telling everyone this, and that's why Michelle, it would negate the idea that she thought that this it was gonna go on and on and on, despite the fact that at least there was all this optimism being said literally the night before the disappearance. So I just wanna put it on the record, the court has not allowed that. I'm gonna ask the court to reconsider because it is sort of part and parcel of the defense to be able to elicit what Doulos was telling people about it. It's going to come up at least um, uh, at least with one other witness. And so that's why I ask that the court reconsider that restriction. Well, well the, the gravamen of the offer is that on the 23rd or the 24th, Right now, it's the 23rd. He was happy about the way things were going. There need not be a mention of the custody report. There's already evidence that he was optimistic about the way things were going. That's been testified to more than once. I, I don't disagree. What I'm asking, though, is the court is also precluded to have any witness talk about that he was at least talking about the, the proceedings that he was, that how things were going in the court was optimistic. And I would have asked this witness um, whether they toasted to new beginnings as a result of those statements about the actual court proceedings. Not that he personally felt it, but he believed that the court was going his way. That's the purpose of it. Well, if that's the offer, there need not be mention of the custody study. 
were things oh. going his way in court, according to him? Yes. Yes, I thought they objected to even mentioning court, and that's why the court, I thought, precluded that question. I don't have to mention the study at all. Well, if the, if the question is whether he thought things were going well in court on that date, without reference to the custody study, the court would allow that. All right. But any effort to pry open what was happening in court and what was filed in court, other than the court understands that there will be a witness who will discuss what the filings were and when those filings were done. But again, it's really the same question. Was he optimistic about Custody with his children, yes. Was he optimistic about the way things were going in court concerning custody? Yes. It's the same question. Right. You can bring the jury out, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ma'am. How are you? Good afternoon. Just a couple questions I had. Um, I actually just wanted to ask you, Council asked you if there was anything odd or any anything in hindsight about looking back at that dinner party on May 23rd. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ask you about your answer. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you said no. Uh, but you clarified that with saying at the dinner party. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else that you thought was, uh, in hindsight, odd or different? Not at the dinner. Um, everything I testified with respect to interactions and feelings, et cetera, at the dinner um, was completely accurate. The question of hindsight in this case, um, how it is relevant to that statement is after the warrants came out and all the circumstantial evidence came out pertaining to FOTUS, it, um, it seemed as though perhaps well, our- I have to object. If after he was arrested, she's has an opinion based on what she read about, I would argue it's outside the scope of direct, irrelevant. Well, the court understands the testimony to be hindsight testimony. Overruled. You can continue, ma'am. But, Your Honor, the hindsight had to do with the dinner, not about now five years later what she thinks. Your Honor, he specifically asked her, in hindsight, sitting here today, I'm just asking what she meant by her statement. And she has a right to answer that. Well, the question is not whether the witness has a right to answer. The question is whether the question is admissible. The issue of hindsight has come up, and the court is not necessarily convinced that hindsight referred only back to the dinner. So, in other words, the court does not recall whether hindsight referred just to the dinner on May 23rd or hindsight referred to anything. Well, I asked the court then to review the testimony because that was the question, and that's what I asked about even now. Was there anything about the dinner that evening that was odd or in any way? Well, because of this, this is the problem that arises. Hindsight about anything, just at any time, is not going to be admissible. Hindsight about May 23rd will be admissible. 
So the court's understanding is, the limitation that is, is looking back now, is there anything about what was done on the 23rd? Anything you noticed? That you're now thinking about that you didn't think about on the 23rd of May, 2019. Because what the court wants to avoid is this. Looking back now after you've read media reports, watched media reports, is there anything about Fotis Dulos now that you're thinking about in hindsight that essentially you didn't think about back <coughs> on May 23rd? And the reference could refer to something Fotis Dulos did back in 2014. <coughs> Or 2016. So the court, in fairness, wants to limit that testimony because it may be unfairly prejudicial <clears throat> to tag any particular time in the acquaintance between Ms. Reich and Fotis Duos. So if it concerns May 2000. May 23rd, 2019, the court will allow the question. Thank you, ma'am. With respect to May 23rd, 2019, is there anything in hindsight that you thought was different or odd? In hindsight, what sticks out to me is the dichotomy of the positivity of that evening and what subsequently occurred and again, with the benefit of hindsight five years later and continuing to process that concept, um, that dichotomy becomes more pronounced. And this was the first time you had met Michelle Traconis? No. No. When did you first meet Michelle Traconis? In 2017. And you had gone out to dinners with them? Correct. And you had gone eaten at for Jefferson Crossing? Correct. It's the first time you met um, the Haynes's. Is that um, right? May, 23rd, May 23rd, 2019 was the first time, yes. Okay. And uh, that night there was the toast, and the toast I think you testified was because things were going to end. Was your testimony, is that right? Uh, I believe I testified to the fact that there was going to be a positive resolution for both parents mm -hmm. and much of the negativity that affected all parties, the children and the parents, and the extension of the family would end. That was the purpose of my statement. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I just have a few questions. When you talked about the positive resolution that you were talking about on May 23rd, 2019, was that specifically upbeat about how things were going in court, according to Mr. Dulos. According to Mr. Dulos? Yes. Yes. And was it uh, optimistic uh, from Mr. Dulos about how the things were going into the future that he would be spending more time with his children? Correct. No further questions. One second, Your Honor, if I may. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. You may step back. Thank you, Your Raise your right hand. 
We solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence we shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God upon the penalty of perjury. Please state your name and spell it for the record. I'm sorry, what? Say your name and spell it for the record. Cheryl Briere, C H E R Y L. B is in boy, R I E R E. Good afternoon, Ms. Breer. Hi. Would you please indicate to the members of the jury uh, what your profession is? I'm a hairstylist. How long have you been a hairstylist? 25 years. Could you tell the jury where you uh, practice your trade, your profession? Uh, in Avon, Connecticut. Where do you live, by the way? Granby, Connecticut. Do you know Michelle Traconis? Yes, I do. Uh, could you tell her how you met uh, Ms. Traconis? Um, I was working at a salon on 44, and she came in and wanting her hair done, and I just happened to be the girl sitting at the front desk. Um, so we just started chit-chatting, and I said, well, why don't I book you with me? And she came in a couple days later, I guess, um, and I started doing her hair then. When you say 44, you're referring Route 44, to Route sorry. 44? Route and, 44, Avon. And does Route 44 have another name in Avon? Main Street? Albany Avenue? Albany Main? Avenue, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and you were a hairdresser. What year was that? Do you remember? That I started doing hairdressing? No, that you oh, met that Michelle. Oh, that I met Michelle? Um, 2018. Do you recall over the course of the next uh, year, couple of years, how often did uh, Michelle come into the shop to get her hair done? Probably every three to five weeks. Did she usually book with you yes, as her always. as her hair stylist? Yes, always. Do you recall whether you saw Michelle during the week of um, May twentieth, two thousand nineteen? That is the week before Memorial Day weekend. Um, I can't specifically say to the date, but I think she was in on a Saturday to get her hair done. Do you recall, do you recall reading or learning something about the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, the wife of Fotis Dulos? I found out on the news when everybody else found out on the news. Before you found out about it, did you see Michelle Tricona that? Yes, I did. Yes. So, so what did so it So I'm going to say like maybe a week before I found out I had done Michelle's hair. All right. So what do you, if, if the day that, do you, do you know when you found out? It was like a week later when everybody, when it came out on the news. So I'm going to say a week, week and a half later. All right. And this was, you're saying a week before that, that you saw uh, Michelle? Yes. Um, if I were to tell you, just to get orient the time that the allegation was she disappeared on May 24th, 2019, on a Friday, what day would you have seen Michelle? Saturday. The next day? Yes. Would you just, uh, how many times would you say over the previous two years had you, had you met with Michelle? <clears throat> um, the last two years? Before, no, before, oh, before that. Before that, that. before that. Like, every, like to have her hair done every three to five weeks. Um, we became friends. Um, we did some small women's small business um, things along the way to promote women in small business. What kind of business? Did you have any business interaction with Michelle yes. during that time? Um, one of them was um, she sold rugs. We put her rugs in our salon. Um, I bought several rugs. Um, I have a little side business without wine. So we had a, um, a little wine tasting at another friend of ours' um, shop. Um, so... You know, just promoting small women in business. That Saturday, what was the reason that you were in contact with her? She came to get her hair done. Did you, in fact, cut her hair that day or yes. trim her hair, whatever, yes. style her hair? Colored her hair, yes. Okay. And would you describe her demeanor and how she was on that occasion? Michelle is always happy. She's just a positive person. I don't, I, I never see her mad or anything like that she's just always uplifting she lifts other people up 
Let's she, talk about May 25th, 2019. Okay. That day. Okay. Was there anything unusual about her behavior that day? No. Do you recall what you were talking about with her subject matter? Your Honor, I'm going to object at this point. Uh, relevance, uh, hearsay. Well, the defendant's demeanor one day after uh, Jennifer Dulos was missing is relevant. The topics that came up is also are also relevant, but the court is not going to allow testimony into the substance of those topics. So Ms. Overruled. Ms. Greer, do you understand the difference? But I'm not asking you to say what she said, just what topics you were talking about. Um, we always talked about family and the kids. Um, you know, what, what are you doing this weekend? That type of thing. Was she, at this point, happy or sad? No, she was always happy. She was happy. On that day? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Do you know what time her appointment was with you? Dad, I can't. Was it in the morning? Honestly, I, I can't say. All right. Thank you. I, I mean, if you want to know my hours, I could tell you my hours were in nine to one if that helps oh so on saturday so on saturday work. i do work nine to one so she was in that time frame if that helps you All right and when you say till one do you take an appointment at one or is that when you leave i would take an appointment at one so you don't know whether it was nine ten eleven no so. I, I don't recollect All right i have no further questions briefly if i can i'm, I'm sorry what hi ma'am how are you i'm michelle manning i represent the state we've never met right no okay uh actually just a couple of questions so that Saturday would have been uh, about Saturday Memorial Day weekend would have been about 525 2019. Yes. Does that date sound right? Yes, that sounds right. Okay. And you worked between like nine and one yes. ish. Okay. And Michelle Traconis came in to get her hair cut. That was your testimony yes. or hair uh, colored. Yes. Okay. And she was happy. Yes. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Nothing else. You already may step down. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Would you please indicate to the members of the jury where you are employed? I am a Farmington police officer how, in the how, town of Farmington. In where? In the town of Farmington. <clears throat> Could you tell the jury how long you've been an uh, officer with Farmington? Uh, I've been an officer in Farmington since 2012, or no, sorry, 2009. I left. I have to think this through, but uh, technically... Uh, just made 11 years. During that time, we just indicate what positions have you held with the Farmington Police Department? Uh, I started out as a regular police officer. I was assigned to the mall for a period of time, and for the last uh, four years, I've been assigned as the evidence officer. So we're, liaison. we're down here in Fairfield, Fairfield County. When you say the mall, would you just indicate to the yeah, director of the West Farm? So Farmington Farm. has a, a, a substantial mall called the West Farms Mall. 
Um, part of it's in West Hartford, and but most of it's actually in the town of Farmington. It's tends to be our busiest area in this in the uh, town. After you were uh, assigned there, what else? What other positions did you hold? Um, that, nothing substantial there. I mean, I in in Farmington just for the time that I've been there. Um, it was the officer, Chris <coughs> Arms Mall, and now the court liaison officer. And as the court liaison officer, are you also the individual who acts as the evidence officer for the town of Farmington? Yes. Could you just indicate to the jury, what does the evidence officer, let me rephrase the question, what is the evidence officer's responsibilities in the town of Farmington? Uh, I'm responsible for logging in and logging out all um, evidence found property and uh, tracking that, making sure court forms are filled out, uh, moving those forms and evidence back and forth between court and various uh, locations and keeping track of that. Um, are you also responsible for receiving evidence from other law enforcement agencies? Yes. So receiving evidence is, is in, in totality for wherever it's being generated. I, if it's being deposited with the, the uh, police department, I'm responsible for it. Were you subpoenaed uh, to come here today? Yes, I was. Were you asked to bring something in particular? Yes, I was. Would you please indicate to the uh, jury what it is that you uh, were asked to bring? Your Honor, well, this is a point that state's objecting. Well, the issue of what you were asked to bring is not probative. So the court's going to sustain that objection. Did you bring a document with you today, an envelope? Yes, I did. Is it sealed? Yes, it is. Could you just tell us where you received this from? Uh, from the Connecticut State Police. And is there a document that indicates that you received it from the State Police that, uh, that uh, acknowledges your receipt of this document? Your Honor, I'm objecting if I can well, at this time. Well, the issue is whether these questions are probative. Did you receive a document from the state police indicating that they sent you a document? The court does not see the probative value of this series of questions. So sustain. May I see the document that uh, you brought with us with you today? And this is the envelope that the document's inside. All right, I'm going to ask that this be marked for identification. Well, any document can be marked for identification. Could you just tell the, uh, the jury, when did you receive this uh, envelope? Well, by my uh, time period, so my property evidence label on it is listing that on May 13th, 2020 is when I logged it in as evidence. Who did you receive it from? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly the person, but it was a Connecticut State Police um, crimes detective. Without actually stating the name right now, is the name of the individual indicated on the outside of that envelope? Yes. Did that envelope come from the Western uh, District Major Crime Squad? I believe it did. Was it in connection with the case of the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? It was in connection with um, Mr. Dulos' uh, suicide. And showing you what has been marked as Exhibit PP for identification. Can you just tell the jury what that document is? This is a receipt uh, that I signed um, by the state police for the um, various items that they turned over to me as part of their processing the scene for the um, suicide or death of Mr. Um, the deceased. Does that uh, receipt include the whatever is the, that envelope that you're also holding, which is uh, double Q? Yes. Exhibit 0390 is listed on this, and it's what their case number or tracking number for evidence listed. 
You said it was 0390, what number? Uh, so uh, it's listed as exhibit 0390, handwritten note. And that's what their exhibit number also relates to the tag that's on the envelope. Hang on, I'm going to ask the witness to open. I'm not going to offer it through this witness. There has to be additional uh, foundation lay, but I'm going to ask that the witness open the envelope so that the chain of custody remains in place. And may I do that? Well, is there going to be a challenge to the chain of custody? There's um, not to the chain of custody at all, Your Honor, to the relevance and hearsay nature of this, but not to the chain of custody. Well, this witness is not going to testify concerning content. So if there's no objection to chain of custody, the envelope need not be open. Oh. There's not going to be a challenge to the chain of custody. Okay. Um, in any event, then, um, I'm going to ask that the envelope remain as an exhibit for identification through this witness. And um, I do offer exhibit... Q, Q. Let me just make sure I'm talking about the right one. I'm sorry, I'm offering exhibit PP, which is the receipt showing this witness's signature and receipt of that document. Well, there's more on that document than just information concerning the seat. So documents should be shown to the state. I gave a copy. He did, Your Honor. And I'm objecting to this coming in as an exhibit. It's, uh, as Your Honor has indicated, there's more than what is in counsel is offering. I also don't see the relevance of it. It's also a hearsay police report statement. Um, counsel, uh, the witness has already testified as to its nature. I would object to it coming in. Well, it's a receipt indicating that this witness received a document from the state police. But it's more than just a receipt. It just says more than state police sent this document on this date and it was received by the Farmington police. It says more than that. So the court is going to sustain the objection. Well, it does indicate what is in the contents of that exhibit. Well, that's, that's, that's the concern, counsel. Sustained. Thank you. I have no further questions of this witness. Nothing further. Officer, you may step down. Thank you. So Sergeant Sean S E A N Bailey B A I L E Y. Sergeant, you may be seated. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Would you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where you're currently employed? The Farmington Police Department. How long have you been employed there? Nineteen years. What is your current position at the department? Who are you responsible? I am a uh, patrol supervisor on the day shift. Over the course of your career, were you a, a police officer anywhere before you were a police officer in Farmington? Yes, I was a uh, police officer in Manchester, Connecticut. 
as a police officer in uh, Farmington, could you just tell us generally what was your assignment in um, January of 2020? In January of 2020, I was yeah, I'm going to object relevance. Well, this was a matter that was preliminarily discussed outside of the presence of the jury. So what the court is going to do at this point, ladies and gentlemen, the court is going to take up legal arguments on a matter. And we'd ask you to just retire to the deliberation room while the court does that. So essentially, put understand this testimony to concern uh, a document uh, allegedly offered, authored rather, by Fotis Dulos, commonly referred to as a suicide note. Is that what this testimony is? No, Your Honor. This witness is the one who was called to the house um, because Mr. Dulos was uh, apparently missing from where he was supposed to be. He observed uh, somebody in a vehicle. He, he observed Mr. Dulos in the vehicle with the with uh, committing suicide with the with the hose vacuum hose attached to the car. He pulled him out with another officer. He called the emergency rescue uh, crew. He was present when. Um, I'll just, and um, at that time, I'll just note that that's when the note was seized. It then went to the state police. It was Detective Kimball who called this witness to go to the uh, house. And in fact, so then they found Mr. Dulos there. So the, the main import of this, even if the court does not end up allowing in the uh, suicide note, which I'll note is marked as um, 0390 on that uh, receipt, that um, the circumstances surrounding it, uh, surrounding the, the fact that Mr. Doulos is unavailable is the thrust of this testimony. Um, I would not be asking this witness, I do have one more, who actually is the state police uh, individual who actually sees the note and put it in that envelope He's here as well as name, the name of the officers on the envelope. Maybe we don't need him. He's the state police detective from the major uh, Western District Major Crime Squad. But if there's no objection as to uh, chain of custody, it may not be necessary. I'll just note he's here. That's, that's Detective Barbero. So this is to get to the background about why Mr. Dulos, Mr. Dulos is unavailable. And I'm going to at least try to make the argument uh, that the court then should allow in the suicide note uh, as a under the residual hearsay exception, but we would have to get into the background, which I believe separately is admissible before that note would come in. In other words, I wasn't going to offer it through this witness if there was going to remain an objection. But that certificate is self-authenticating. That's grounds for anyone to conclude that the witness or Otis Dulos is unavailable. So the court sees no reason for this testimony. The, the witness will also testify that Anna Curry was present at the time. He spoke with her, uh, the, you know, the other occupant of the house um, at the time. I would not even get into what she told him, but it would be to indicate who that individual was. There was testimony from Detective Kimball yesterday about that and it was in the video, so. The date and manner of Fotis Dulos's death is not relevant. The court, if there was evidence of a death certificate for counsel's purposes to show that Fotis Dulos is unavailable, the court may consider admission of a death certificate. But date and manner and who was present is not relevant. He's unavailable. 
based on the death certificate. Does the state wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, as I have indicated, the state feels any, as Your Honor said, anything that has to do with the actual manner and cause of, of circumstances surrounding the suicide is not relevant. Uh, the state's concerned with respect to the suicide note, Your Honor, and the use of the note as a, uh, under the residual exception to the hearsay requirement, if I may be heard on that. Um, so well, that hasn't been offered yet. That hasn't been offered. So that's really the crux of the matter, Your Honor. So but, the court sees no reason for testimony if the state is willing to accept that there's a death certificate. On a death certificate is the date of death. That's self-authenticated. Yes. Well, the, the second argument I would be making is, although I can see that the Connecticut uh, rule of evidence limits dying declarations uh, in a prosecution side to uh, dying declarations uh, concerning the, the, uh, the victims of, of a crime, I would make the argument under Chambers versus Mississippi that it's unduly restrictive when the defense wishes to offer a dying declaration, which otherwise would be considered uh, um, have uh, uh, evidence of reliability because it not only occurred, was written and found with Mr. Dulos, but refers specifically to the fact that because of the charges he is going to, um, uh, he's taking this action. So the timing is relevant uh, to that argument as well as the question of whether or not it needs to come in under the residual hearsay exception, the jury at least need to know that it was, uh, that the death was under the circumstances time-wise that it would be material and relevant under the, for the defense. That's my point. Well, again, the state, as the court understands it, would not object to the admission of a death certificate. Now, the residual exception to the hearsay rule, first, Counsel, the court believes, is correct in that the dying declaration exception refers to the dying declaration of the victim. So, in actuality, unavailability would not even apply in this case. However, the court sees the the progression of counsel's argument. Secondly, even if the court were to consider the residual exception, the court would use as guidance the dying declaration exception. But the dying declaration exception requires, there has to be indicia of reliability. And so the dying declaration exception requires that the statement had to be so far against penal interest. Let's just use that example. If this were not the defendant in the case, that a person in the uh, declarant's position would not have said it unless he or she believed it to be true. Well, first, if the court is to use that as guidance, court cannot see, based on the facts of this case, that there's a statement against penal interest, because there's no I, indication. I can't make that argument. I'll be quite frank, Your Honor. It was not against Mr. Dulos' penal interests. No. Not against his penal interest. No. But there are other indicia of reliability, and I would have elicited that. I'll just state for the record, so that we're here, this witness, um, the department received a call, I believe he received a call from Detective Kimball saying that Mr. Fotis was supposed to be in court at that time, and it was shown that he had not left his home. He was sent there for those purposes, only to discover that he was uh, in a running vehicle with the garage door closed, the lights were on. He broke the window together with another officer. They pulled him out, and so the indicia of reliability and the fact that the, the note was taken on that date 
goes more to the fact that it was related to the fact that he believed he was going to jail. So in a way, it's against his, literally against his penal interests, although the statement itself exonerates uh, my client. So that's why I'm arguing it as not as a dying declaration, but instead as a, a residual hearsay or under a Sixth Amendment right to present a defense exception, which the Connecticut has not yet acknowledged. Well, again, the court understands, believes counsel's argument. The fact that the statement does not include an admission militates against a finding of trustworthiness. Even if it included an admission, there's no using uh, the guidance of the code concerning statements against penal interest, there's no indication that Fotis Dulos intended to be alive for prosecution. So it could not have been a statement against penal interest because the code contemplates the declarant being alive to face prosecution. He did not intend to face prosecution. So it would not even be a statement against penal interest. It's essentially an effort that counsel may argue is memorialized and trustworthy, but the court sees that it doesn't meet the measure of trustworthiness. There's no admission, and he didn't intend to go to prison. Court wouldn't allow the statement. All right. In any event, is the court also precluding from the defense putting on the circumstances surrounding the death? Yes, that's precluded. All right. Well, then um, I don't have any other questions of this witness. Okay. The jury can come back out. Yeah, then I'm also going to release the, the Detective Barbero since there, there would be no need for him to uh, testify about taking the, the exhibit and delivering it to the uh, pharmacy police department. Thank you. And then I will offer the death certificate as an exhibit at this time. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Um, I just have one question. Did you become aware at some point that Mr. Dulos had died? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to um, mark this. I have no objection. And what's the uh... RR? Are admitted as full. Oh, it's not my fault. <laughs> And um, and you knew that Mr. Dulos actually died in New York, not in Connecticut. Yes. Right. And this is Exhibit RR. It's a copy of the death certificate showing that um, that Mr. Dulos died on the 30th of January of 2020 in uh, Bronx, New York. 
signed by the uh, medical examiner of the uh, city of New York. I have no further questions. Thank you. I have nothing, Your Honor. Thank you, Sergeant. You may step down. Your Honor, I, I don't have any other witnesses ready for today. Thank you. So will a witness be ready tomorrow at 10 o'clock? Yes. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's session. Please do not discuss the case. Please regard no media reports about the case, and we plan to see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.